uh, it's 9.30, let's make a, a start. Uh, it's welcome you to the Development Committee. I'm Councillor Filmer, Chairman of the Committee. Um, <clears throat> can I at this point just welcome Councillor Charlie Riches to the Committee. Uh, welcome Charlie and hopefully you all enjoy your limited time with us, but uh, I think you'll find it a very interesting committee and uh, hopefully you'll uh, uh, be able to take a full part as I know you did your full training uh, last week. So thank you very much for doing that so quickly. Uh, just a few uh, housekeeping notes before we get on with the uh, the, the business of today. Uh, I've not been told there's a planned fire drill this morning, so in the case of the alarms going off, then please make sure you exit the room by the marked uh, doors. Uh, if you require toilet facilities during the meeting, they're located through the double doors at the centre of the rear wall. Uh, if you need to have a drink, there is water uh, at the side of the of the room. And if I could ask anyone who's in the meeting today, either virtually with us or or in the room, if you could make sure that your mobile phones are either turned to silent or turned off, just so they don't interrupt the meeting or affect the PA system. Uh, just so you know who's in front of you today, uh, to my right are officers from the Democratic Services and Legal Section, to my left are the officers from the Development Team, uh, and they will be the ones presenting the applications before us today. Uh, we're also joined online by other council officers, uh, members and members of the public. Uh, and I believe we're also joined this morning by the uh, portfolio holder for development, Councillor Slocum. So uh, welcome to all who are with us. Um, today's meeting is being held as the last few have been as a hybrid meeting so that the committee members are present in the canal side at North Petherton. The meeting is also available online through Teams so that members of the public and other councillors can take part virtually. Uh, However, only councillors who are present and in the room are able to vote on the applications that are before us. Uh, can I remind those who are joining us online to keep their cameras and microphones turned off until we get to the point where you're uh, being asked to join us uh, in the meeting in terms of speaking if you're registered? And can I please uh, just ask everyone to note this meeting is being recorded and that recording will be made available through uh, the council's website uh, after the meeting. The format of the meetings as per the agenda that's been published and a copy of the officer presentations can be found on the council's web pages uh, for those who are online. Uh, each application will be taken in turn. The officers will outline the background and detail of the application and will then have the public speaking time for those who've registered. Uh, all those online will, as I say, will remain muted until I call you to speak and only those who've registered to speak uh, can address the meeting. Members will then debate and ultimately decide the applications before us. During the debate, once the uh, comments have been made by members, there will be a proposer and a seconder uh, for a particular resolution. Members will then vote on this proposal and only those who've been present in the room throughout the presentation are eligible to vote and they can obviously vote for, against or abstain. Uh, we'll then count those votes and the result will be announced. So if we move to the agenda itself uh, for today, uh, item one, uh, is apologies for absence and uh, Mrs Nicholson would you like to uh, give us those please. Thank you Chairman we've got quite a few today. Um, we have received apologies from Councillor Bolt, Scott, Perry, Murphy, uh, Councillor Pierce for this morning, uh, Councillor Granter and Councillor Haywood has not attended. Thank you very much and all, all the remaining members of the, count, uh, the committee are, are present in the room. Uh, if we move to item two, which is urgent business, I have not been advised of any urgent business that isn't on our agenda. Uh, item three is public speaking time for, for members of the public, for those of you who have registered to speak. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the format is we'll get to each application in turn. The officers will give the background. Those of you who are in the room will ask you to come forward to the speaker's table. Uh, those who are joining us online uh, will ask you to turn on your camera and microphone. In both cases, you have three minutes to address the committee. Um, if you're in the room, you'll see the clock count down and you can see how much time you've got left to go. If you're joining us uh, online, then we will notify you when there's one minute of your time left to go. And again, in both cases, if I can ask you to draw your comments to a conclusion for the three minutes, that would be much appreciated. Item four is uh, declarations of interest. Uh, I'm going to start on that one because uh, we've been advised that the items on pages 35, 39 and 43 which are the County Council roundabout signage applications. Um, those of us who are 
uh, members both of the district and of the county and, and the forthcoming unitary uh, have been advised that we need to declare, I believe it's an, o, a, an other registrable interest. And because there's a financial element to the uh, the signage uh, that the advertisement would go on it, then we've been advised that we should leave the room and take no part uh, at that stage. So uh, when we get to those applications, uh, those of us will have to leave the room and it will then be up to the rest of the members who are in the room to elect a chairman for that section because both myself and the vice chairman will be out of the room at the time. Are there any other decorations of interest? So we'll start with Councillor Grimes and work our way around. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just the same as you outlined, um, that's the only um, interest today. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Betty. Thank you, Chairman. Pages 35 and 39, they're in my district ward, but I took no part in any of the consultation. Thank you. Councillor Kingham. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, this in the, this, the afternoon session, it's on page 62. Don't worry about the afternoon, we'll get you to do that. And anything relating to drainage board. Ah, thank you. And and we'll do the same for Councillor Bessie, the same for myself. And Councillor Richards is on the drainage board as well. And so is Councillor Hendry. OK. So we're coming around the room, uh, Councillor Facey. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's this morning's application. <clears throat> Agenda item 5.1, major application. Uh, this is within the boundary of Burnham and Hybrids Parish Council. I do not take any part prior to this meeting and discussions on this item, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Well, on behalf of the Vice Chairman of the Council, welcome and Happy New Year to you all. Thank you very much. Councillor Hendry. I, I'm Somerset County Councillor for Highbridge and Burnham, so page number six, uh, Highbridge. I have not spoke to anybody, don't know anything about it other than what's in front of us. Thank you. Okay. And, and just to confirm, Councillor Henry, you're also in the same position with the pages 25, 39, sorry, 29, 35 and 39. Okay. And Councillor Glassford? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, application on page 20, 29. A member of the town council took no part in any discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, for, for members of the public, it's important that, uh, that members declare any any background they may have had on an application. The, the declarations you've heard today, I obviously explained the uh, other registrable interests relate to the county council one earlier, but where you've also heard members declare that they've taken no part in any discussions at the town or parish council level, that's because we have a standing order within this committee which basically says to avoid predetermination, in effect making your mind up before you come to this committee, um, you either get involved at the town and parish level or you get involved at the district, you cannot do both and it's our advice that members don't get involved at the town and parish so that they can come to this meeting, they can be part of this committee and they can be part of the decision making. So as you've heard from a number of members, they've taken no part in those discussions and therefore are able to do that. Also with the drainage board, the same thing applies, the drainage board are a consultee, they make comments on planning applications and if members got involved in helping to decide those comments, then again, they would be predetermined. So where you've heard members declare they're part of the drainage board, that is to say, in effect, they've taken no part in those discussions at the drainage board level, and therefore that leaves them open to, uh, to get involved at the district level. That takes us then to the planning applications themselves. So we move to page six. Uh, we're in Burnham and Highbridge, and I think Mr Noon is introducing this one, please. Thank you. If I could just quickly share the screen, that one. And there we go. And if I just lose that from the corner. Right. Thank you very much. Um, this is an application for a redevelopment of the site to provide a single block comprising of 29 apartments with ancillary parking at lower ground floor level. The application site is just to the south of the roundabout. You've got Market Street just running off to the east of the roundabout, then the A38 running through town centre. It's this triangle of land just to the south of the roundabout in more detail here. Uh, so we have the end property of on Market Street number two with its rear extensions on the east side of the site, an area of parking which is included half of the area of this parking nearest the site 
is included within the development site and then island house a block of flats or converted older building that is now sort of a number of flats um, just there to the southwest of the site access arrangements are down high uh, the the road down through here um, we were the access into the parking area at the moment which i'll show you more photographs of the application site for the purposes of the planning application the th very thin red line but it goes up to the edge of number two market street in it does include the whole of that parking area next to island house coming up to the uh the road at the front of the site and then just you know including this everywhere sort of to the uh, northwest of this little thin red line here and the access there off off high bridge key into the parking area just down here the site as it currently exists um, it was cleared of all buildings a while ago the scrubby vegetation as indicated by these lines on here um, and then an area of parking just between the site and island house which is all left over from previous uses it is owned by the applicant any parking that is occurring there is at their goodwill it isn't anyone's parking as of right and then just some sort of details of the existing buildings adjoining the site this is the, the flank elevation of number two market street there are a couple of windows in the first part of the rear extension then it's essentially it's a blank wall and then at the very far end, the gable end of that extension facing, um, effectively facing the site shown in the bottom corner here, there are two windows in that. Then just really starting at lower ground floor level, working our way up through the scheme, we have um, 31 parking spaces for the development, an area of bin storage just about here, cycle storage as well a retained parking space for the basement flat of island house whose access would be maintained through this basement park the lower ground floor parking area so we indicatively shown along this red line and that they would have an entry door system and parcel drop box for the postman and any deliveries and a pedestrian gate in the secure what would be a secure um, a secure lower ground floor there would be sort of sliding doors for the cars to get in and out and then they would have their own pedestrian access as well to to ensure that we maintain access to that flat i will come back to how we achieve that at, towards the end of the presentation moving up uh, just yeah just a little bit more detail there that shows their pedestrian oh jumped um, that just shows a bit more detail there in terms of the pedestrian access for those people um, and their their drop box. Coming up to the ground floor, so this would essentially be at street level. You can see the point shared access for all the flats coming off of the sort of junction, just off the roundabout here, off the pavement. Uh, they would have their own sort of postal delivery boxes just in this lobby area here. And then we have the flats arranged around the perimeter of the block um, and then internally have sort of like an atrium where there would be sort of some planting uh, within the site and then there's a sort of walkway linking the two halves of the building towards this book back at the back this part of the building here is all on stilt so that's over the parking area the access would be in underneath it we then have a number of sort of terraces along here next to number two and then the other flats have balconies towards the rear this tree indicated here is within the sort of back courtyard garden area or up to the rear of number two and then coming working away up to first floor level we have you say a number of balconies along here um, those are subject to sort of some privacy screens to ensure that there isn't any undue overlooking of these two windows in the side of number two, which are indicated here. And then also at the back of number two, we've we've got some details to show you in a moment, just to ensure that there is no overlooking from these balconies to the windows in the back of number two. 
coming up to the second floor. So again, you've got the same layout or mirrored as, as you go up through the building. And then you sort of see in a bit more sort of clear detail, this old area here that would have the lifts and the stairs. And then there's a sort of specimen tree planted in this atrium area. And then finally, the roof plan. Um, just to sort of cap it all off. So you have some dormer windows facing out into onto Market Street and then a more modern design around towards the rear. The main elevations, now this is sort of looking at the view from Market Street. Obviously, this is very much flattened out. It's a curved frontage that comes from uh, Market Street round the roundabout towards Island House. So in the top drawing, we have the number to Market Street on the left hand side and then the building curves round the highest bit in the middle and then sort of coming round to a comparable height to Island House on the right hand side and then there's just a sort of slightly more pulled out view at the bottom just sort of really looking all the way down Market Street unlikely that anyone would see that in one vista um, that would be a sort of passing vista as you walked or drove up Market Street. Coming round clock, anti-clockwise, so the view from the island house side of the site, you have sort of essentially two rendered panels with a sort of mansard type roof on top of it. So the overall height comparable to um, the, the current height of, of island house. Uh, the parking below with the cycle stores and everything you would see there. Um, this rendered panel here is just you know, intended to be in a light colour to provide some reflected light towards Island House and then high level windows in this side. And then you can see the balconies just over here um, and then the rear of you're just showing in here. The, the rear elevation with those two windows of number two Market Street would be just in here behind that tree. So coming round so the elevation that you would be able to see if it weren't for that flank, yeah, the, the rear bit of mark, uh, number two, Market Street, if that wasn't there, you would see this all in one go. Um, the Market Street rear addition is outlined sort of in here. Um, so you would see from views from the southeast, you would see probably over the top of that, you might see the top of the building um, above that if you were far enough back although in the parking area looking back towards Island House you would see this bit here above the entrance to the parking um, so looking an internal elevation really just all looking if you were in the block the, the main this block here looking out to the, the back of the block that fronts onto the main road, you would see this, this elevation. So it's a more modern design towards the rear and then the sort of more traditional frontage out onto Market Street and the roundabout. And then really just sort of internally, so you've got the section through the bit fronting the road and the section through the bit next to number two Market Street and then internally you would have this atrium and then the back of what is effectively the main focal point on the front would be seen through here. So this would be a view you might get a glimpse of from um, Highbridge Quay looking between the two rear wings of it towards the back of the building um, but there are underneath the arrow there are walkways through there so it wouldn't be a view that is sort of readily visible in any public from every public vantage point and then sort of looking the other way um, from basically the view from the back of the main frontage um, looking at the this rear wing that is sits next to number two market street so again this is in sec you got the section through the frontage of the bit of of the bit on on the, the facing the roundabout and then you just have this more modern rear of the building In terms of sort of preventing undue overlooking, um, I've sought to negotiate in some um, raised wall on the boundary. So this is unit number eight, who would otherwise be very much level with that upper window. 
of number two Market Street. So this would be raised, the wall adjacent to that, just to prevent any overlooking to that window from this private terrace area. Um, here, sort of moving forward a bit, these are the windows nearer the front of number two Market Street. So unit six, again, has a terrace that would be sort of more or less level with that, with that window, as would 16 and 25 above it, um, potential overlooking to that window. So we've got some privacy screens in there to ensure that the overlooking of those windows doesn't occur. And then just sort of an internal view, I think that arrow, apologies, is from, the, is from the wrong side. That arrow should be looking from the southeast here. But those just show the raised up wall at the back of unit eight and the raised screen here at the, at, uh, for unit six, just to prevent any overlooking to number two. And then just looking at the access arrangements coming out of the um, sort of existing area onto Highbridge Quay, that that's the visibility there is is perfectly acceptable for the Highway Authority, and the Highway Authority no, raised no objection in terms of the, any increased use that might arise of the junction onto the A38. There's already quite a lot of parking there that would sort of you know, would, would persist. So in terms of highways issues, there's, there's no issue. There's no no issues for the County Highway Authority. Um, just to give you some visualizations of the building. Um, you know, just some useful 3D models that just give you an idea of how this sits next to number two, and there's Island House over there, and how far up you know, it, it, it sort of extends. So we've got the privacy screens on these balconies and these terrace areas in here to prevent overlooking. Um, just looking sort of down across the A38, so you've got Island House, and there's the sort of development. So you've got a traditional frontage with sort of, you know, dormer roofs, and very sort of legible um, traditional uh, building form around the frontage, and then a more modern to the rear. And then just looking, coming round the site again, sort of anti-clockwise. So you can see you've got these sort of walkways linking the two wings at the back. So that sort of atrium area there is like unlikely to be sort of have any clear views of it. And then round to the far side, just looking back the other way, so you can see the rear wing extensions of number two, and you can see how these, these buildings all wrap around it. Um, and then we would have the privacy screen here next to the terrace of number eight, with some screens here as well. Um, and these walls here on the sides of these balconies would prevent any sort of overlooking down into the back of number two. There has been an issue and was an issue last time this application was presented to committee. It's it, um, in terms of its relationship with the basement flat of Island House. This is, and I think it's a, derived from estate agents. Uh, details does look a bit like that, but it gives you an idea of the internal layout. Um, there are three windows facing the site. They sort of enter, enter you know, to provide a degree of light to a study and into the, you know, as I said, French doors there. The main entrance here off this hall is then has sort of the door and a window here. The living room and both bedrooms have no individual windows. They rely on borrowed light coming through from the right-hand side. They are particularly dim at the moment. They probably rely on having lights on whenever you're using them already. That situation, I accept would not be improved by this development, but given the levels of light they currently receive, as shown in these photographs, so this is the living room, the, 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 the unit has been, I believe, sold during the lifetime of this application and access was able to be gained by the applicant to show that, you know, to show what, what the situation is. That's the living room, that's bedroom two, and bedroom one, just sort of looking on the left-hand side within the bedroom and on the right-hand side from what is annotated, I think, study into there. So those rooms currently rely on probably lights being switched on whenever they're used at the moment. Yes, 
there would be a diminution of light by virtue of quite a large building being built quite close to it. But the amount of light that would be lost relative to what is there would not be so significant that refusal is warranted. And then some photographs stood up on the roundabout. There is the site as it currently exists, number two Market Street on the left, Island House on the right. There is Island House. You can see those three windows, French doors facing the site. View down through over the parking area, you can see there's the rear wing of number two with that tree in its back garden. And this area of parking, which is, you know, possibly being parked in without the owner's blessing, but it is with at their tolerance. And then looking back, there's those two windows in the side there. And then just all stretched a little bit or a panoramic picture. Um, but you can see there, there's the rear windows of number two. Just a bit close up there. So that's the basement flat. And then just courtesy of Google Earth, stood on Highbridge Quay, looking back at the site before they cleared it to give you an idea of what was there. So sort of essentially two storey brick buildings. That's the view from Island House. So that's what they were looking at previously. And then just to give you an idea of what the relationship with the back of number two was, you can see quite clearly there's those two windows, of the building next to it as, as was. And that's what it did look like before the site was cleared. So what we have now is essentially a larger version of that building in the middle um, with sort of traditional form either side of it. And then looking down from the A38, that, that gives you an idea of what the previous situation was. The proposal obviously built out further from the site towards Island House. I've got a number of updates um, to make here. In terms of the recommendation is to approve subject to achieving affordable housing, there is also, if necessary, because of the provision of a, an intercom system from the, ac the pedestrian access for this basement flat, that might require their involvement. It may not, but if necessary, we need to secure the provision maintenance and not, uh, of ongoing access to the basement flat. Um, it may not be necessary in a section 106 agreement. I'm suggesting a condition as well, which I'll come to in a minute. But in case it is, um, I would just add the words, if necessary, to secure at the front of that. Just stress that it may not be necessary to do it by section 106 once we see the detail. Updated condition 17 to reflect drawings that have come in since the application was agendered. Um, so we now have screens um, privacy screens for units 6, 16 and 25. So that condition can be updated to compliance rather than submission of details. Updated condition 20, um, again, because we have details of how that would be achieved, we don't need further details, we, we condition compliance. An additional condition 21, Electric vehicle charging points are shown within that ground, uh, lower ground floor basement area, and this will just require their provision in accordance with a specification. So we know where they will be. We just want to ensure that the right specification is provided for those. And the additional condition 22, just to agree the details of the pedestrian gate, the safety, safe pedestrian route, uh, intercom system, to, to ensure that deliveries and visitors can still access and make their presence known to occupiers. Um, that condition may be sufficient without the Section 106 obligation, as, uh, but we need to see the detail of that and reserve the right to put it in a, a planning as a, in as a planning obligation as well, if necessary. And then finally, to more or less finally in terms of updates, to reflect the additional drawings, um, your plans list, the yellow ones there have been updated. You can see the revisions of, were up to Q in some of them, and that towards the bottom section HH is a new one. So those updates to the drawings. And then in terms of the key issues, the pre 
the principle of this development is a, re is a residential redevelopment of an urban brownfield site. That is welcome. That's when a lot we yeah, we want to see these sort of sites reused, and residential is a perfectly acceptable use in this location. An identical scheme was previously approved on this site. That ex uh, and previously, and prior to that, there was a mixed residential and retail scheme that. Um, I think the site was cleared in anticipation of doing that. We accepted with the previous grant of the identical scheme that we uh, are not insisting on re retail here. We accepted the arguments at that point in time that a 100% residential would be acceptable here. That remains the case today in terms of um, the, the, the nature of the development. So there is planning history here. It has led us towards the, an approval of this, exactly the same scheme previously. I believe I've negotiated in some additional privacy matters to help that with that. And we are, we've maintaining the access to the basement flat. So I think with those, those are improvements that I, I, I think offset any lingering concerns about this scheme. So the principle is established. In terms of highways, Again, it's as previously approved. We've got one space per unit. We've got electrical charging points, which is a real bonus. We have a you know, well-planned refuse and cycle storage area, which I'm suggesting be uh, conditioned to ensure provision. In terms of the design, it's as previously approved. We've got a strong, attractive frontage that does have a nod to what was previously there. It sits comfortably between the heights of number two market street slightly higher than that and about the same height as island house so we got that sort of frontage that grades up from lower to higher across the frontage of the site in terms of the living conditions for future occupiers these units are all considered to be of appropriate size they would, as i said they would have parking cycle storage refuse arrangements all provided for um, in terms of the relationship with number two market street i think the additional screens and privacy measures secured by those con conditions 17 to 20 are a betterment on the previous scheme and we have looked carefully at the access to the flat at island house which we think we can you know ensure is maintained we would also through the con the i think there's construction management condition in there we would also look to make sure that their access is maintained during the construction phase so subject to the slightly updated recommendation the updated and additional conditions, updated plans as detailed on the previous slides. The recommendation is firmly one of approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. As you'll see, we have a speaker on this application. So if I could ask Tony Hammack, if you'd like to come forward to the table, please. Good morning. Just remind you, you've got the three minutes on the clock. You'll see the time counting down and start when you're ready. The microphone will be turned on when it you is, start. Is it? Okay, yeah. great. Good morning, Chairman, members, and Happy New Year. I'm Tony Hammock from Property Link, and thank you for letting me address you today. The site formerly the Cornhill and known as Canal House 1 Market Street is a brownfield site within the settlement boundary for Highbridge. The buildings were demolished due to being structurally unsafe some 15 years ago. The development of the site has not taken place despite an extent permission for mixed use and a permission which lapsed in February 2022 for the same application before you today. The site has been extensively marketed with the extent permission as a mixed development and subsequently as a flatted development for over 15 years. There has been no interest in the commercial element and due to the death of the developer, the residential permission could not be started in time to discharge the pre-commencement conditions resulting in the same application being submitted in April 2022. The site is con constrained and the build costs are extremely high due to the topography of the site, with street level and parking level being at different levels. The site occupies a prominent position on the A38 relief road for the M5 in, market, in, in the market town of Highbridge. The town is undergoing a regeneration programme and this landmark site is key to the town's regeneration. Unless a viable scheme can be delivered, this site will remain for the next decade as an eyesore. As detailed in the committee report, the site complies with policy in respect of the local and neighbourhood plans. There is only one consultee objection which has been addressed through the, the consultation period. Uh, 
The site delivers betterment in many ways, regeneration of a derelict site in a prominent location, quality design and specification which reflects the local vernacular and respects the amenity of the neighbouring properties, a development that makes maximum use of the land and due to careful design is similar in appearance, size and scale to the original building, formerly the Cornhill. Secure undercroft undercroft parking and cycle storage meeting policy, much needed one and two bedroom homes which meet national space standards and disability requirements. Delivery of 15% affordable homes, over 89,000 will be generated in SIL payments. Apart from the Town Council who are concerned about the loss of retail, there are no objections from consultees. Sustainable, available and deliverable. I commend the officer's recommendation for approval and hope that members will support the application. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions, please? Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, it's good to see that at least we've got parking with this, and only when we get flats on applications, there's no parking, and you've got to find somewhere in the a car park somewhere around the area. Um, entry into these properties, is it by residential gate security? Mr Noon. Um, the proposed properties, the flats, would have a main pedestrian on the junction of Market Street and the A38 in front of the roundabout. Um, they would also have vehicular access, obviously, through the back, and I would assume they would all have their own swipe or electronic mechanism to do that. And then there is a lift up from the ground floor. So, yeah, there's effectively two ways for them to access. Yeah, what well, about refuge collection? Refuge is, is down from the rear at the back. Um, it's now, let's just quickly. There we go. Um, so there they, we have a refuse storage area. In fact, the next slide shows it a little clearer. Um, in here, bin stores, and then there is access. You've got you have that existing parking area immediately outside of this gates, where there'll be plenty of room for the bin lorry to arrive, turn, load, depart. So that so, doesn't have to go through security. Uh, they would have to get. They would have to have a mechanism to get in through the gates to collect the bins. Um, I think condition number something or other towards the end does require the submission and agreement of a refuse management scheme that and the access of the bin lorries would be fall in there just to make sure that that's been provided for. But clearly they're not going to lock the bin men out given you know, the, the arrangements down there. Right, thank you. I mean, so I was happy when it came through the first time and I'm still happy with the application now. So. Facey, sorry, I've got Councillor Facey and then Councillor Betty. So Councillor Facey. Please do. Councillor Henry, would you care to pass the mic? <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Alistair. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, I completely welcome this proposed development. And may it happen quickly, please. It does resemble the moment uh, something I can remember as a child. Uh, traveling to Bristol with Grandad uh, for a bomb site. So please, looking to my left, can we get this built immediately? I'm a bit confused by the objections from the Town Council on Highbridge. I think they could do with some training. Um, first of all, I'm glad to see that Hink the Burnham Town Council uh, know that Hinkley Point is going to be finished soon, which is great news for everybody. Um, some other details on there, which I, I, I think are, I don't think um, I'd be too keen actually. They notice that some of the windows overlooking the A38 don't um, actually open. I think in the middle of the summer, if the M5s close, I don't really want to be looking forward to opening the windows over the A38 with fumes coming from there. So quite a few of their objections, Chairman, uh, I'm not happy with, but that's me being pedantic. I, I think it's a first class development, as Councillor Kingham said, the design from the frontage, which is what's all about people are going to be seeing, that is going to enhance Highbridge a big, big time, Chairman. Uh, I'm quite happy, Chairman, to propose that we follow the officer's recommendations along with all um, the um, bits and pieces that Mr Noon's recommended to us 
uh, well happy with it. And as I say, Chairman, sorry to repeat myself, ASAP, Chairman, the better first. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Betty. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I too am surprised by the comments from the Town Council, um, especially about the flats not being disabled friendly. Um, is this correct? Or is because I would have thought that we were able to make the flats to fit everyone's needs. So to read that they, the design of the flats are not disabled friendly, I think is ridiculous. Can I just check, Mr. Noon, have you any comment in, in terms of disabled access? Um, that normally is looked at by building control. So they, they will, they, they have their standards in terms of internal space. So all the corridors and, and doors, they, um, the access from the frontage is showing. Oh, sorry, gone the wrong way. There. So the main frontage is indicating some steps. So that might be an issue at building control stage. But what we do have is lift access from the basement to all floors. So that that, that would certainly maintain access for all. So basically, the town. So it's not correct then with what the town council's been saying about I've, the disabled friendliness of the actual building, about no wide doorways, etc. No, I have no. No, I think that those doorways will all be looked at by building control when the time comes. Um, maybe they focused on those steps from the main front entrance and looked at those in isolation. Okay, with that, I'd happily second, Councillor Facey. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions from members? I'm not seeing any, so we have had a recommendation, which is to grant permission subject to all the additional conditions, the amended conditions and the section 106 update. Is there anything additional to that? No, no, I okay. think they're all as per on the slides, just okay. with the section 106 a bit about the access arrangements, if necessary. Understood. OK, so we've had that recommendation moved and seconded. All those in favour of that, please show. That would appear to be unanimous, so that's clearly carried, so permission is, is granted. Right, members, if we move to the next application where we now have a speaker who will be joining us uh, online, that's the application on page 43, uh, which is the Cannington roundabout, uh, which, as I mentioned earlier, those of us who are both county and district members will need to declare, have declared interest and will need to leave the room. So myself, my vice chairman and councillor hendry i think will be leaving uh, i will then hand over to mrs nicholson to ask for a proposal for a um, a chairman to step in during those items and and just again for members to clarify we also have two other roundabout applications um which will be the same decoration so we're proposing that those three will be taken in order after each other and then we'll come back to the next application uh, at the end so i will declare and I think because that's how we yeah approached. I think we do so so we'll go with that declaration we'll leave I think we'll, we'll we'll go with the fact that we've got we should have a speaker here he may join us during the presentation if he doesn't well that's fine we've got to leave the room anyway so um I think we'll, do, we'll, we'll take that item now if he's missed it that's that's um, an issue for the councillor to sort out okay right as I say I shall leave the chair and hand over to my committee manager right members if we can have a proposal for a uh, new chairman for the moment councillor betty can i propose councillor kingham for chairman please seconder Thank you, Councillor Riches and Councillor King. And would you like to come and take the chair? Um, no, just actually you can. There, yeah. it's that you will need a microphone. Well, no, if you're coming up here, then you don't. So you just got the microphone there. All right. Okay. And then I don't think you'll need anything else, to be honest. Okay, right. Thank you.
might need to bring the microphone slightly towards you as you're right. Yeah, right. I'm a slim down Bob filmer. Right. Item on the agenda is roundabouts at um, North Cannington Bypass. Amelia. <laughs> Is that close enough? Yeah, OK. Uh, good morning, everyone. So this application is um, at the Cannington roundabout on the um, bypass where Rodway joins the um, bypass. The application is being heard at committee as the parish council view is contrary to the officer's recommendation. So the application is an advertisement consent and therefore the considerations are limited to um, visual amenity and public safety. And these are the relevant policies of the local plan. So the application lies to the north of the village of Cannington. And um, relates to this roundabout, as I said, connecting the bypass with um, Broadway. The application seeks consent for the placement of three non illuminated advertising signs on the roundabout. Each sign will measure approximately half a metre by a metre and will be mounted on poles resulting in a total height of just under 0.9 metres. So the application um, has limited considerations, as previously mentioned. In respect of visual amenity, the signs are not considered to be of a size and scale that would result in visual dominance to the detriment of the area. In terms of potential impact on neighbouring residents, the proposed signs are not illuminated and therefore unlikely to impact resident residents. In respect of highway safety, the Highways Authority have not objected to the proposal and due to the low height and lack of illumination, the signs are not likely to result in a detrimental impact to highway safety. The signs are positioned within, within the roundabout and therefore do not encroach onto forward visibility of vehicles approaching the roundabout or visibility to their right where giving way would be required. It is for these reasons that the proposal is considered compliant with the relevant policies of the local plan and the officer recommendation is to approve the application. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do have a speaker, I believe. Um, are you uh, able to um, hear us and give your report? Absolutely. And I don't think. Um, so Dyer has joined us, so we will need to just go straight into debate now because okay. he's, he's not logged in. Right, as we haven't got Councillor Dyer, any Councillor Facey? Thank you. I, I realise it's quite straightforward, but are these signs going to be as bare and as ugly as that? Are they going to be surrounded by flowers? At the moment, it's the round... a bit blunt, isn't it? Yeah, so at the moment, the roundabout is um, grassed, and I understand that um, in this area they do have sort of wildflowers growing on the verges, um, but there is grass. I've just realised I should have put some photos on this side, um, but it is, it is grass at the moment. So I, from what I can see on, the, um, on this, I understand they're putting it on top of... Well, that's the curved island, so I guess that's... They're just being placed on the roundabout. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I see, yeah. see where you're coming from, but well, it, it's, it's not our officer's fault. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have been far better if somebody who came up with this had actually put a floor designed with it, because it does look a bit black and white. And just um, to provide some further information for that, obviously the roundabout signs are coming in as advert applications. So the only thing we're allowed to consider on the advert applications is the design of them and highway safety implications. So design wise, there's one for each arm of the roundabout. So it's not considered to be too many. Um, and the design's fairly simplistic because it's just going to have Somerset um, County Council supporting local businesses at the bottom, whether that will end up changing to Somerset Unitary Authority um, in a few months. Um, and then the provision of a, a blank area that can be used for any one of the businesses. So local businesses will be hiring out that space. So it won't be quite as bland as, as that image, but that image obviously shows it as blank. Um, because it's an advert application only, we don't get landscape details. 
but a lot of the roundabouts within the vicinity are getting wildflower planting put out, but that's not something that we can control through this application. That's a big help um, because what we're going to be looking at possibly on there or going to be something like we got at the moment, Joe Bloggs' his furniture shop, yeah. East Over or whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy with that. Thank you. Let me just ask the um, regarding light, lighting on these signs. They're them? non illuminated. There's no lighting. Yeah. I thought it said illuminated somewhere. Non illuminated. Yeah. Non -illuminated. yeah. Okay. Any other, any other d debate on this one? We have a, a recommendation on this one. Oppose it. Thank you. Second by Councillor Glassford. All you in favour? Yeah, unanimous. Yeah, yeah, unanimous. Yeah. Yeah, what's going on there? I think it's me. I think it's Mark Freud. Doing, what we're doing. Page 35. Page 35. Yeah. Right. Kings Drive. Page 35, Kings Drive. We're doing Just three roundabouts. <laughs> Who's doing this one? Sorry, Liam. <laughs> Sorry, no. um, so it's like sea above, doesn't it? Thanks, right. Chairman. Um, Liam. So, uh, as a fairly similar proposal to the last one, um, so we have identical signs located on a roundabout. This time we're in Bridgewater. Um, it's the Ascot Drive and Kings Drive roundabout, which is located on the Kingsdown Estate um, to the northwest of Bridgewater. So you have Bristol Road here, the M5 here, and the roundabout we're looking at is here. Um, there's a there's an existing Tesco store that's been recently built here, not yet opened, but in terms of context, this is where we are. Uh, so we're looking at four signs on this one. Uh, each one will face onto each arm of the roundabout. Um, in line with the County Council guidance, they felt that in terms of highway safety, um, the best position for each of the signs was to be facing onto the arms of the roundabout to ensure that visibility would not be uh, impacted upon. Um, so we have a layout plan here which shows the proposed signage um, and the existing location of the safety signs on that roundabout as well. Um, once again, they're identical to the ones that we've just discussed on the previous uh, roundabout. Um, it's not considered there'll be an impact on highway safety due to their low height. Um, and obviously the design on the advert itself will be subject to uh, the business that will be sponsored by the County Council or will be supporting the County Council, sorry. So uh, in terms of the location, uh, this is where the signs will be. So this is a view from the south, this is a view from the east, and each arm of the roundabout will have a, a sign facing onto it. In terms of context, it's not considered the signs themselves will be a significant impact on visual amenity. Um, and based on their low height and their position on the roundabout, set back from the edge, there, there will be no impact on forward visibility for vehicles using the roundabout or entering it. So based on the details submitted, it's considered the, re the, rec the recommendation is to grant consent based on the fact that the uh, public uh, safety and visual amenity would not be severely harmed in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Do you have any um, debate on this one? Second. Thank you, Glass Country. All in favour on the approval? Unanimous. Um, we do have Councillor Dyer on uh, online, I believe. Councillor Dyer? No? He's there. He's there, but we can get through to him. Need to just let him know that he's. Uh, Came to Dara, by the way, we we already yeah. um, approved the roundabout for Cannington, so unfortunately you uh, you're too late. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I was told I had an email yesterday saying it being pulled. 
from the agenda. He had an email to the parish council yesterday to have been pulled from the agenda. No, well, we had to. We've had to amend it slightly because of obviously the county councillor stroke district council's involvement, so we've altered it slightly. Yeah, fair enough. OK, thank you. And the next one, Councillor Moon. Thank you. Um, this is an application for three signs of a similar nature to the ones we've just looked at on the at the Bath Road roundabout. This is where the Bath Road roundabout takes you, know, you get the junction to Kate down to the hospital. So there is the roundabout. And then the hospital is over here and the care home fronting onto it. So it's essentially a three R. Oh, it's not coming through to us. Right, sorry. Uh, press the wrong. There we Thank go. You. Apologies. So there is there is the roundabout with the hospital and the care home to the east. Um, so just from the application drawings, the the, the roundabout in the middle there. Um, just showing there, although it is has got a fourth arm to the north that is very small uh, serving just a number of residential properties so we're only looking at signs that would face each of the principal arms and so there you have it the green dots are the sort of the arrows to show you tell you to go round the roundabout and then we have the three signs right in the middle each facing the principal arms and the signage of the same proportions meter wide 50 centimeters high on Stat on um, posts about 2.6 meters high, meaning that it's less than a meter over all. Sighted in the middle of the roundabout, such that it, it doesn't conflict with the highway safety signs. There is the roundabout viewed uh, from the east, looking towards town in the left hand picture, and then the other one just looking across the roundabout towards the um, Bower, uh, Bower Lane side. Uh, so in terms of the issues, it's it's amenity and public safety. The sizes, the signs are of a size that they are not considered to be overbearing or result in any impact on amenity. Their positioning on the roundabout would not be prejudicial to road safety in any way, and the highway authority has not raised any concerns. Accordingly, the recommendation is one of approval. Thank you. <laughs> any, any remarks from counters? I do have a. Um, I'm not particularly happy with this roundabout because of the it's a very busy roundabout and you've got to be very aware of, of traffic because of the size of it mm. and also if you, you've got signs in the middle and then you've also got the chevrons around the outside it, it it is a roundabout that is due will be looked at in terms of redesigning it as the East Bridgewater housing allocation get, goes through. Um, it is what it is at the moment. It is small. The signs are to be clustered in the middle as a sort of essentially a focal point. They would not in any way obscure the safety signs that you see in the right hand photograph. Um, so from that point of view, I think you know, it is you know, akin to a feature within the middle of the roundabout. The fact that it would have some writing on it is not felt um, to be distractive to, to road safety. Um, but I do hear your point about the nature of this particular roundabout. It's not the best it's, roundabout in the world. It does get very busy on that roundabout when you've got, when you enter it, you've got to be very careful of other traffic there. And if you're doing that, then how, how are you going to be able to read a sign in the middle? I think looking at the positions of those chevron signs um i think on the previous one there um you know they are i mean okay on the on the that's the um that's the west side coming down western soil and uh, not west of the balf road that way i think that one sign will probably be obscure not not entirely but it will be behind the chevron sign so it maybe of limited value as advertising space, but not prejudicial to highway safety. Um, the other ones would have clear views um, from top of, I suppose that's Bower Lane 
and then Bath Road town side of the roundabout. So I think there is a balance here between the safety signs and the advertisement signs. And because they're non-illuminated, small and low, I think they would not be prejudicial to safety. <clears throat> right, uh, Councillor. Yes, Councillor Glassford. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah, I do agree with you that uh, it isn't a, bit, a very good roundabout that. Uh, but at the end of the day, they're that small with signs. Uh, and if there is a possibility they're going to have a look at the roundabout in its entirety, I would propose that we go along with the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I too have some concerns in this roundabout, like yourself. Um, this roundabout is used um, dramatically and it's always busy whenever I've come through there. Um, connects the Poldens up to Bridgewater. Um, I don't believe that this would be safe to have signs on this roundabout. Um, it's already, a, like I said, a very busy roundabout. Um, and to have um, signs on there where people will be being distracted by the signs, there's going to be accidents caused on this roundabout um, due to the nature of how busy it is and how people drive along it. So I'm personally, I cannot support this application. Thank you. Right. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, Chairman. Um, can I just clarify, um, Mr. Noon, um, about the roundabout possibly being bigger in the future? Because I, I did notice that Alex um, Gladford um, said, as part of his moving move, move to the officer recommendation, he took into account the possibility of the roundabout being bigger, but if if it's if it's not a certainty, it's not a material consideration. I just wanted to bring this point in. Yeah, I I think that's correct. It, it's any improvements to the roundabout would come in due course and completely unrelated to this application. Any reworking of the roundabout would wipe this effectively wipe any consent away. It is a five year consent by nature of all advert applications. Um, in terms of how busy it is here, um, I do accept that you know there's not a lot of signage in the you know around this roundabout anyway um, at the moment. But I will also point out that elsewhere in town at, at junctions there are advertising hoardings near junctions. They, in my experience, the Highway Authority only really raises a highways concern when you have these modern ones with illuminated. Um, signs with changing images that are in line with your view of the junction as you approach it. And that's pretty much the only time where they, you know, they, they routinely raise objections. In this case, we have to bear in mind, OK, it is a busy roundabout. It is a small roundabout. There is some signage on it already. But are, with the addition of the signs of this size and nature, unilluminated, be of such a hazard to road safety that we could reasonably withhold consent. I think given the nature of the roundabout, given the nature of the signs that are proposed, that situation wouldn't arise. I can see why the Highway Authority have not objected. Can you um, you go back to the, sorry, Councillor Betty. Thank you, Chairman. Do you have any pictures with these signs already in place on the roundabout? Which I would give us a better definition of what they actually do look like on a roundabout. I'm not aware of a scheme that's rolled out yet, so no. Thank you. Uh, can you go back to the picture of the roundabout? And see, if you look at that roundabout, the Chevron has been hit already, and that's without anything else being on there. I think that comes down to the geometry of the roundabout <laughs> rather than a distraction. Um, yeah, I think we acknowledge the roundabouts on the small and tight side, but would this sort of feature only sort of hip height? Um, so you'd actually, you know, you'd see it below the Chevron signs, if at all. Um, you know, is that so going to be so distracting as to, as to be? I think that, you know, it's, it's a severe um, impact on highway safety. I, I, I think it's hard to say that with the nature of the signs as shown there on the bottom right. But, yeah. OK, well, we had a proposal for and we've had... Can we just confirm? Just a 
are still without the extra bit. Yeah. Councillor Glasser, are you still happy to propose the application with without the other yeah, the other bits? Yes, I am. And we have a second or Councillor Facey. Okay, we had a proposal and second, although it's in favour. Three, no, okay. three, and three, against. Three, <laughs> yeah. 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 three, two. So that's um that's carried. Thank you. You are delightful. Can I propose that we have a comfort break now, just while everybody else is coming in and out? Um, so ten minutes. Thank you. Members, if you can turn in your papers to page 99. And that's agenda item 6.1, which is planning appeals decided. <coughs> Right, thank you very much. Um, so we had an outline planning application for erection of 19 dwellings. Um, that... OK. Um, it's at Land at Sturt Bushes, Wedmore. This was a hearing that we had recently. The appeal was allowed, so they were granted planning permission. Um, the reason for that was that there were viability arguments put forward by the developer as to why they couldn't provide affordable housing. Um, we contended that they could provide affordable housing, did an independent viability appraisal. Um, the appellant did not put forward a case as part of the hearing um, statement, so no information was given before the hearing. Um, but within the hearing, they declared, you know, economic crisis, cost of construction, materials, etc. Um, and the inspector effectively fell on their side and said that, you know, construction is difficult at the moment. He accepted um, no affordable housing on this scheme, so we lost the appeal, despite the fact we had what we felt to be quite an evidenced case in terms of them being able to deliver affordable housing, but the inspector accepted that they couldn't. Um, the other issue we had on the site was that the ecology information was slightly out of date, um, but there was a previous consent that is on site that's under construction, so the inspector held weight on the previous consent and therefore didn't agree that they would need to renew the ecology information because ecology has already been disturbed through the construction on site. So we did lose that one, um, but we did have an, an evidenced base. So um, not massively happy about that decision. Um, the cost to us was paying for the external viability consultant. So we we costed out to get the evidence that we felt we needed to justify the case, um, but we didn't ask for costs um, from the applicant appellants and they didn't ask for costs from us. So um, no additional costs beyond what we paid to evidence the case. Um, and then certificate of lawfulnesses, which is item 6.2. Um, there was a withdrawn application, which was a certificate of lawfulness for existing use of residential building with two holiday cottages, um, to um, two additional bedrooms for bed and breakfast use. Um, but they've withdrawn that application. Okay. Uh, we also granted planning permission for a change of use. Um, sorry, certificate of lawfulness in relation to um, 07-2015 which in itself was a change of use and conversion of two agricultural buildings to private dwellings. Um, so it was confirmation that they commenced the development in time, so that development's still valid. Again, no questions, so 6.3. And then this is applications that have been issued with the Section 106 agreement, so Lakeside, which was a Section 73. They had to vary the outline because the landscaping that they'd agreed at outline stage um, had changed slightly when they submitted the approval of reserve matters. So there was a section 73 that had to have a deed of variation to the original 106, and that's been issued. Okay, not seeing any questions on that one, so that's the last one, I think. That's it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, members, that brings us to the end of the business for this morning, so we will close the meeting and we will restart again at uh, 2.
Minister's Business. Uh, can I welcome you to the Development Committee? I'm Councillor Filmer, I'm Chairman of the Committee. Um, just a few housekeeping notes before we actually get into the agenda itself. I've not been told of a planned fire drill this afternoon, so if bells go off, they're real. Uh, your exits are back through the, the doors you entered and also through the side of the room. Uh, toilet facilities, if you require them during the meeting, are through the double doors at the middle of the rear wall. And there is uh, glasses and uh, water on the right hand side of the room as I'm looking at it if you need to have a drink. Could I ask both members and members of the public uh, and those joining us online, if you've got a mobile phone, could you please make sure it's turned to silent or turned off so it doesn't either interfere with the meeting or, or alternative to the PA system? Um, just so you know who's in front of you this afternoon, to my right are officers from our democratic services and legal team. To my left are officers from our development team uh, who will be presenting uh, the detail and background of the applications before us this afternoon. And on the wings of the table to my right and left are the councillors who will be ultimately debating and deciding the applications. Um, in terms of the meeting itself today, this is being held as a hybrid meeting, which means that the committee itself are meeting in the canal side at uh, Bridgewater, at North Petherton. The uh, meeting is also available online uh, via the team system and so that therefore members of the public, uh, members of the council uh, can join us online to, to view the proceedings. Uh, but I would just say that only members who are present within the room are able to actually vote on the applications before us. Uh, can I also remind anyone who's joining us online, if you could make sure your cameras and microphones are turned off until we get to your application and then I'll ask you to uh, turn those on, that would be uh, most appreciated. And finally, just to remind everyone present uh, that this meeting is being recorded and will then be available online uh, through the Council's website after the meeting has concluded. Uh, the format of the meeting is as per the agenda that's been circulated uh, and a copy of the officer presentations are available for those who are joining us online if they wish to, they can see them through the Council's web pages. Uh, we'll take each application in turn. The officers will outline the application details. Uh, there will then be a public speaking time where members of the public are registered to speak. Uh, and for those of us joining online, I will uh, ask you to turn on your microphone at, uh, at that point. Uh, members will then debate the application uh, and then we'll have a proposer and a seconder for a resolution. And then we'll ask members to vote on that. They can vote for, against or abstain. When the vote is taken, we'll then uh, announce the result at the conclusion. So if we move then to our agenda for this afternoon, uh, the first item on the agenda is apologies for absence. And Mrs Nicholson, could you give us those, please? Thank you, Chairman. We've received apologies from Councillor Bolt, Scott, Perry, Murphy, Granter and Facey for this afternoon. And there is no Councillor Hayward. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the other members are present in the room. Uh, item, the next item on the agenda is urgent business. I've not been advised of any urgent business that isn't already covered by our agenda. Uh, item three is public speaking time. As I mentioned in the introduction, uh, we'll take each application in turn. For those who've registered to speak, we'll then, if you're in the room, we'll ask you to step forward to the speaker's uh, chair. Uh, you'll see there's a clock on the front of our table which shows the speaking time you've got, which is three minutes. It counts the time down so you can see how much time you've got left to go. And if you can obviously wind up your comments before the end of the three minutes, that would be helpful. Uh, for those of you who are joining us online, obviously you can't see the three minutes because uh, it's too small on your on your uh, screens. So what we will do is we'll I'll intervene when there's a minute of the time left to go. I will let you know there's a minute and then that will give you at least a warning that you can start to wind your comments up, please. Uh, item four is declarations of interest. Uh, if I can ask for declarations from members, I'll I'll start off in that uh, I have a couple of declarations for myself. Firstly, the application on page 77 uh, is in Limpsham, which is part of my uh, district seat and the county seat that I represent. Uh, but I've taken no part in discussions with the parish council uh, on this application. And the second declaration is just a general one in terms of any items that make reference to the drainage board. I'm a member of the drainage board, as are a number of members of the committee, and I'll ask them to indicate in just a minute who they are. Uh, and again, that's on the basis that m members of the drainage board will have taken no part in discussions on applications unless they indicate otherwise. So could I just ask members who are on a drainage board to indicate so we can note that for the record? OK, you happy you've got those? That's councillors Betty, Kingham, Riches and Hendry and myself. Yeah. Excellent. Any other decorations? Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, page 77 in my county district ward, but I've taken no part in any discussions on this application. 
Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Betty. Page uh, 90, I'm the ward councillor and I'm a parish councillor, but I've taken legal advice and uh, there's issues raised with the legal team and they've advised me that I could be biased, so I have to leave the meeting. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. Yes, I'm on page 62, Chilton Polden, which is in my district ward, and I've taken no part in any discussions on that application. Thank you. Councillor Richards. Thank you. Page 48, page 58 in the Cheddar Ward, but I've taken no part in previous discussions. Thank you very much. Any on the other side? No. OK, so for members of the public, it's important that you know if there's any involvement members have had in, a, in an application. So we have a standing order within this uh, committee to avoid what's called predetermination, in effect, making your mind up before you come to the committee, uh, which basically says that we can either get involved at the at this level at district or we can be involved at the town and parish level you can't do both um, because there is a danger that if you've made a decision or been involved in a decision at an earlier stage people may well quite understandably assume that you've already made your mind up um, so therefore where you've heard members say they've taken no part in those discussions that is so they can come along to this meeting debate the application and vote whereas if they had been involved they would have to leave the meeting and, and take no part again you heard a, a member declare where there's a possibility there may be a, an in a view that he he could potentially be biased on that application and because of that a declaration has been made and when we get to that application uh, that member will leave the room and take no part in in that particular applications debate that brings us on to then the next item which is the planning applications themselves which is we're starting as i think we have speakers on all our applications this afternoon so we're going to start on the first one that is on page 48 uh, and i believe mr noon you're introducing this one for us today thank you Yes, I'll just share screen and bring the presentation up. There we go. Um, thank you. This is an application for a rural workers dwelling, in this case to be used in conjunction with an equestrian enterprise that is operating at the site, which is at Hythe Lane, uh, just to the uh, outside of Cheddar to the southwest. I'll just show you on an aerial photograph. There it is, you can see the, the reservoir and cheddar to the uh, northeast. The site is off Hive Lane, um, just indicated by the pin. And in more detail there, um, there is the, uh, the horseshoe shape, is this, are the stables. There is a storage barn to the left of that. Since Google went over, there's permission for a, a menage to the west of that storage building. Uh, and then there is currently a temporary workers dwelling on site just to the east of that horseshoe shape. So top left hand corner there is the existing block plan. There is a temporary workers dwelling there, just the, the, the large grey rectangle there. To the top right is the footprint and floor plan of the proposed house with some solar panel array, separate, separate one, just in the top corner there. Um, and then just sort of the, the pulled out block plan uh, of the two bottom pictures, um, just to show that we are, we are out in, in the sticks. Um, the field owned by the applicant is this large field immediately to the north of the, the building group. And then the one bottom with the red H block shape just shows the new house relative to the the existing buildings. The house is of a you know, fairly modern modern design, two wings effectively, or two parts of it, uh, two bedrooms on one side and a sort of open plan living accommodation on the other, linked by a sort of glazed attachment. So it's a low of rural appearance uh, building, it's all akin to a converted barn in terms of it detailing and you know, single story height. There's the floor plan on the left, two bedrooms in the smaller wing, and then a sort of lounge and open plan kitchen diner in the larger wing on the left, on the left hand side. So, and then the roof plan there, just two mono pitches, just sloping away from each other with that sort of linking corridor between. Some photographs of the site, top left, just looking back from within the site at sort of towards the existing building. Uh, serving as a dwelling, which is what's slightly closer on the top, top right there. 
um, just saw other photographs within the site. It was very wet when the officer went out there. Um, but the bottom right you can see is taken sort of across the northern gable end of the storage building towards the menage that has been created to the west of the building group. Uh, top left, just sort of a view from the road outside, sight in behind the fencing. And then we have some uh, photographs of the, the stables and the storage building as all the other photographs that we can see there. In terms of the background and the issues we're looking at here, we have an exception policy that allows for rural workers dwellings in the countryside that uh, uh, would, would give us the justification for a dwelling that would otherwise be contrary to policy CO1, which says there will be no develop, residential development in the countryside unless there is a, a policy justification. Uh, in the background, we have granted uh, a temporary consent for an agricultural worker's dwelling, or no, sorry, a rural worker's dwelling, um, which they have been in for the last three years whilst they developed the business. There was a coherent business plan at that stage. We felt that was worth supporting and allow the business to develop. Um, it is a small holding in terms of agricultural terms. This wouldn't normally uh, six, six point six and quarter, three quarter acres, but this is an equestrian one designed with brood mares and, and breeding stock. And that gives us a very different business model to uh, you know, what we would expect on an agricultural, um, just uh, on, in the background of an agricultural justification. So what, they've, what we're looking at here is based around the brood mares and the foals being raised and sold and other horses being trained and brought on and sold for equestrian sports. These are high value animals. They need a lot of care, particularly when the uh, mares are, are, are giving birth and then the foals rearing uh, as well requires a lot of input. We have accepted that the equestrian business set out at the temporary application stage does justify a functional need on site. So what we're looking at now, it is the same enterprise. We're not looking to, re we wouldn't look to revisit the functional need but what we're looking at here is has the business developed such that it is showing profit and a uh, a sound financial basis that would justify a dwelling now in those terms there we go oops sorry in those terms the there is um we've got financial statements verified by accountants from the applicant that demonstrate that the sales of horses are generating after costs a clear profit in the last three years that is showing it is increasing every year and it is developing as envisaged in the original financial case that was put forward and on that basis we feel that the justification has been made this dwelling on the potential financial side of the test and the functional test we have previously accepted and that is still ongoing because it is the same business. So just moving on to the other unit, other, other issues in terms of visual impact, it is a modest building. The height is no, no greater than the existing buildings on site where it would sit well behind the hedge and the fence alongside the road. Uh, materials are all considered acceptable. The solar array is separate because the roof doesn't align the right way. The roof slopes west and east. So hence the, the, the panel is separate to that. But that makes sense that the building is orientated the way it is because that follows the, the form of the existing buildings on site. Um, we've got a nice tight cluster immediately um, adjacent to the existing building. So the functional need for oversight of the buildings is met by the location of the building. And we're not sort of expanding the building group into the countryside. Um, there is a suggested there a condition uh, that would require the removal of the current temporary home within three months. Obviously, when the permission for that lapses, it was only a three year temporary one. That would also give us the levers to ensure that is removed. But as they are on the same site, it's unlikely that it would be retained. And if it's moved to an unauthorised position, we have enforcement powers. Uh, in terms of highways impacts, we've accepted that this, lo this equestrian enterprise in this location doesn't have any adverse impacts. They're not looking at this point to expand that through additional buildings. We've accepted that the comings and goings from a dwelling on site would not be unsafe in highways terms and making a temporary dwelling permanent doesn't add to any highways impact. So no concerns there. Um, there are no nearby properties uh, owned by other people that might be affected like that. And whilst this is very close to the stables and all the 
equestrian activities on site, which might not be appropriate for an open market house. It is the workers, the owners of the sites. And so they would you know, be, you know, be quite aware of what is going on. And clearly they're not going to complain about their own business. Um, in terms of ecology, whilst we are in the uh, special area of conservation for bats, um, our ecologist has advised that it's unlikely to have any uh, adverse effect on horseshoe bats. And we have conditions to secure enhancement of, of opportunities for biodiversity. Uh, and also, you know, just in case in the removal of the current temporary workers home and putting up the new one, whether, you know, if there were any issues from bats or nesting birds, then we can deal with that by way of informative. There's no reason to assume there would be any harm. So in terms of summary, summarizing our position, the functional need was accepted when we granted permission for the temporary workers dwelling. We've got a clear evidence of a profitable business that is developing over the last three years, appropriate design and detailing of the house, no adverse impacts in terms of ecology impact on third parties or highway safety. And subject to conditions, which I have one update, we recommend the application for approval on the basis that he has met the exceptions test for a rural worker as set out in policy D10. The one condition I would like to just amend is condition three, which is the occupancy one. Um, what we're saying there is a worker solely or mainly employed and any resident dependents. Upon reflection, that's a little on the harsh side. We, we would also give provision for a widower or a widow of of anyone there. So obviously, if there's a tragedy and someone dies, we're not then going to require their widow or widower to immediately move out. So just add in reference to widow or widower, along with resident dependents as the people who are allowed to live there. Subject to that variation of condition three, recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if we come to our first speaker, and it's Clive Pancho, would you like to come forward, please? And just to confirm you're speaking on behalf of the parish council today. So again, start whenever you're ready. You'll see the time on the clock. Thank you. This proposed house is in open countryside and is therefore outside of the development boundary of Cheddar. The MPPF defines rural exception sites as small sites used for affordable housing in perpetuity, where sites would not normally be used for housing. The parish council also do not feel that a justifiable business case has been submitted to allow a dwelling to be built in open countryside. Foals are usually born from May to September when grass is abundant, so not 12 months of the year. As an equestrian business, there is no case to justify this new dwelling as it is neither agricultural nor rural, so exemptions do not apply. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, John White, who I think is joining us via Teams. If, Mr. White, if you could just turn on your microphone and just we can confirm that you can be heard by us here. Uh, yes, good afternoon, Chair. I hope uh, the committee can hear me. Absolutely, we can. So again, just reminding you, you've got three minutes and I will chip in when there's a, a minute of your time left to go to let you know that's the case. Start when you're ready, please. Thank you. Um, good afternoon and apologies for my voice not being with you in, uh, and for not being with you in person. Unfortunately, I have a throat surgery and have to attend a consultant's appointment this afternoon. But at least one of the benefits of lockdown is uh, the ability to talk to you remotely. Um, so therefore, on to the application. My name is John White of AGM. I am the planning agent speaking today in support of the application to erect a permanent rural workers dwelling on the existing equestrian business site. This application is only before you today as the parish have objected with the sole reason that they believe an equestrian business is not classed as rural or agricultural enterprise. However, as your planning officer has confirmed, this is factually incorrect. The business does legally fall in line with the parameters of a rural enterprise and is compliant with both your local policy, D10, and national policy. There is already a temporary mobile home on site providing accommodation for an equestrian worker. This was granted permission by this committee back in 2019. After a successful three years, this application seeks to replace the existing mobile home with a permanent dwelling to allow the rural business to continue and prosper. 
The size of the dwelling is both modest and acceptable in design, and there have been no objections to the proposed plans. Your plan officer has assessed the business plan and accounts and has confirmed the business is viable, profitable, and it remains a central need for a rural worker to be present on site to manage this business effectively. As evidence in the planning history of the site and set out in the report before you, the applicant has invested heavily in their business, which has yeah, allowed the Brinkley programme to expand and running properly in line with forecasts set in the business plan. Both your local plan and the MPPF support rural enterprise. Every opportunity should be given to the local business to continue to prosper and thrive. And I would very much ask your committee to support this application. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Just before I come to members, obviously the, the Parish Council raised the issue about uh, agricultural workers policy and rural workers. I wonder if Mr Noon, if you could just clarify the position on that and then I'll come to members for questions and comments. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Policy D10 is actually uh, is, is our policy for rural workers' dwellings. It is very specifically for rural workers, not just agricultural workers. So if there is a business other than agriculture for which a rural location is essential and that, that business can dem demonstrate that it meets the functional and financial tests, which we would apply equally, um, then non-agricultural workers' dwellings can come forward under that policy D10 in the countryside. Um, so in this instance, equestrian, it's obvious, you know, it's going to be in the countryside. That's, you know, you, I, there's nowhere else reasonably to expect an equestrian business to locate. And then because there aren't, there's no, there's no better way of doing it. We apply the same functional and financial tests to the proposed business as we would an agricultural business to demonstrate firstly that you do actually need to live on site and that the business is sound and profitable because obviously you know we wouldn't want to be granting permanent dwellings for businesses that may just simply fail so that's why three years profitable is normally the test we expect which is met here in terms of the books that we've had it may be that the parish those those books are confidential they're not available online um, but we, you know, as officers, we have assessed those. There was a sort of summary reference to that in the planning case. But the detailed financial figures that we have had sight of confidentially give us confidence that this is a profitable business with every every chance of remaining so. Thank you, Thank you very much. Councillor Pearce, you indicated. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I personally don't have a problem with this application as it satisfies policy D10 uh, concerning rural workers' dwellings, and it seems to be very low impact. So I would, um, I'm happy to actually propose the officer's recommendation um, with the variation on condition three. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Councillor Hendry. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman, Councillors. Uh, I too, absolutely no problem with this at all. I think it's a very good venture. I won't start quoting policies because we know them anyway, but I'm happy to second um, Councillor Pierce. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions from members? Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I mean, say we have a, a small industry here and locally in Cheddar. They produce a business plan which shows it's profitable. Obviously, they want to continue and expand their business. So, again, I have no um, problems with this application. I'm not seeing any other indications from around the members. So, in which case, we have a recommendation that has been proposed and seconded, which is to grant permission with the updated condition as outlined by Mr. Noon. All those in favour of that, please show. Assume That's clearly carried unanimously. So, that is permission granted. Right, members, that takes us to the next application, which is on page 58. Uh, we move to, well, we remain in within the parish of Cheddar. And Mr. Titchener, I think, are you introducing this one?
Well, we have declared if that was the case. So. In the relationship with the council, we would know it. So. He was on the list of speakers. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. Uh, so this is the, uh, an application for the erection of a first floor side extension with an uh, integrated carport and uh, a front extension to existing garage below and installation of dormers to the front and rear elevations. So it's a uh, a revised scheme uh, uh, located. At I don't think I'll stay up. I'll just lean. <laughs> Uh, so uh, it's located at 11 Woodview Road uh, in uh, Cheddar. So um, it's before members today because of the objection of the parish council. Uh, so the site is within uh, existing built up part of Cheddar. So as indicated uh, by the red arrow here. Uh, so here we have the block plan just showing the uh, proposals. That's a semi detached property uh, with um, uh, the proposal would be uh, largely on the sort of side and uh, rear. So this is the plans just of the existing, uh, so an existing bungalow with accommodation within the roof space. Um, it's a semi-detached bungalow built with brick and render with a UPVC windows and a tiled roof. It already has a single storey rear extension. So um, this, as I mentioned, it's a revised scheme. So these are plans of a scheme which was approved in 2022. Uh, so that already has information uh, and, it, and um, it's a very similar scheme uh, that we are considering today to that which has previously been approved. So that scheme included the two storey uh, side uh, extension sort of largely here on the block plan and here uh, with the, the dormers to the front, uh, the more square uh, single uh, long dormer to the rear. Uh, uh, which included some additional first floor accommodation as shown in this location. So that was what is approved. That's an excellent permission and they have a couple of years on which they could implement that. So that um, represents a, a fallback position. This is what they are seeking permission for uh, now. So the only differences uh, relate to the position of this rear wall at first floor level. So the applicants have had to or propose that the rear wall here is pushed out further out in this direction uh, compared with the previous scheme by 50 centimetres. Uh, so that's how this scheme varies. And the reason for that, as we understand it, is structural because it would be better supported by a uh, uh, wall immediately underneath. Uh, so um, rather than any other reason to gain additional uh, floor space. Uh, so um, in terms of uh, the impacts of that, uh, the, we wouldn't consider that to be particularly visual be, uh, because the proposals are located at the rear of the property. It's more uh, an amenity uh, related uh, consideration. Uh, so um, it will make a small reduction in the separation distances between the rear, uh, between the proposal and the rear of properties um, uh, to, onto which uh, the proposal backs. Um, nonetheless, um, uh, there are two rooms at the rear, um, and these are bathrooms. So those would be served by, a, a, uh, they would have obscure glazing anyway. So there would not be views possible uh, from that. Um, there is also, so there is one room remaining, which from which views uh, would be possible. That's shown as a study. Um, there is quite a degree of mutual overlooking amongst properties already within the area. Uh, um, and that seems to be accepted locally. Uh, and to that end, we haven't received any objection from neighbours with regard to the proposal. Um, this change. There we go. So just some photographs now um, for context. So the lower photograph just shows the existing uh, bungalow as it is at present. Uh, the upper photo just shows the existing rear of the uh, property as it is uh, currently. Uh, you note, uh, as mentioned, there are properties with existing dormers within the area which contribute towards that sense of sort of uh, existing uh, sort of uh, mutual overlooking. As you can see, this is a photograph taken from the applicant's rear garden. There's already uh, properties within that area that have dormers within the roof uh, that um, uh, do sort of share some. Uh, some sort of intervisibility between them. And again, a photograph taken 
uh, from higher up from the applicant's property to show any sort of position of dormers on rear uh, rear uh, roofscapes sort of overlooking uh, each other. So again, take into account the fact that there is an extant permission uh, that they could implement, the lack of objection from neighbours, and the sense that there's a, a, a degree of mutual overlooking. We consider the changes of the rear first floor by that 50 centimetres would not in itself warrant refusal of the permission. Uh, so um, uh, just by way of an update, we would consider it best practice to add conditions to secure biodiversity enhancements. So we would be looking in addition to what's set out in the report to add a condition to secure provision of a bat and bird box. Um, Overall, however, we would consider the scheme to be very similar to the previous approval. Um, we don't consider the issues raised would warrant a refusal, and therefore we are recommending that permission is granted. Thank you. Uh, again, Clive Pancho, if you'd like to come forward, please. <clears throat> okay, start whenever you're ready, please. Um, this is an unusual situation whereby an existing property is built on the top of it like an escarpment. You have to put this in your pictures. You've got a, the existing property up here. You've got a very steep escarpment coming down with a footpath which goes down to the base, and the other neighbouring properties are well are just below it. And it, uh, it's very steep, as I said. There are several properties below this one in question, so further height with dormer windows cannot help but oversee the properties below. As advised, the Paris Council against this application uh, as it would totally overlook the properties below and is therefore we consider a major privacy issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions, please? Councillor Richards. Oh, can you just confirm, I think you did say that there's been no objections from any neighbours who may be overlooked or not? Yes, yeah, that is correct. We haven't had any comments from members of the public, so no objections from uh, from from anyone on, on this application. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions, Councillor Kingham? Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. As we've already approved the previous application for the same property with very minor amendments to it, and I would have no problem in approving this application. Thank you, Councillor Kingham. I must admit, from my own point of view, I, I, I think the difficulty we would have in, I, I understand where the parish council are coming from in terms of privacy and overlooking, but the problem we've got is we've got a condition, a permission there already that puts those windows in exactly the same elevation, but only 50 centimetres further back, um, which I think doesn't, doesn't necessarily leave us a lot of room, but Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I don't have a problem with this at all. Um, did you? It's been proposed. I'm quite happy to second that. I don't have an issue with this. Thank you, Chairman. And and just to confirm, but both of you as proposer and seconder are happy with the additional condition relating to the biodiversity that was raised. Yes, yeah, certainly. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments from members? Okay, we have the recommendation to grant permission subject to that additional condition in for biodiversity. Uh, bat box and bird box. All those in favour, please show. That's clearly carried, that's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, that then takes us to our next application, which is on page 62. Uh, we move to Chilton Poulton. And is it Mr Titchener this time? Again? Uh, yes, thank Excellent. you. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. So, yes, so this is an application for the erection of one dwelling, uh, including uh, parking. It's located at uh, 88 Broadway, uh, Chilton Bolden. Uh, so the application site is located uh, in a central location within Chilton Bolden, within the settlement limit. Um, uh, and as you will see uh, close up, it's located, it's this end terrace property, which locate, which benefits from a, a reasonably generous uh, plot. And again, as indicated with the red line here showing the end tariff property uh, and um, and the space within which the dwelling is is to be proposed. So this is just the existing elevations and floor plans of the property. So it's a three bedroom uh, dwelling end terrace property uh, on which the uh, new dwelling would be uh, attached. So these plans uh, show uh, in outline um, just the footprint uh, of where the proposal will go with a slight uh, step back here uh, and with uh, 
new parking provisions to serve the existing and the uh, proposed dwelling uh, to be formed in the lower part of the garden. Um, the, these are elevation plans uh, showing the uh, proposed dwelling, so it's being supposed to be put on the end to sort of mirror the terrace form of the uh, existing uh, uh, arrangement there, but with a slight step back, um, and I think when you see the photographs, there's um, that the intent there is to mirror the other end of the terrace, where there is a, a property that has been similarly sort of stepped back, just to give a more um, uh, a sort of balanced uh, view uh, to to the terrace. It is pro proposed to be a, a three bedroom unit, so you can see the three bedrooms upstairs uh, and the bathroom, and then with a lounge and uh, um, kitchen dining area at ground floor. This is the uh, site plan showing how the um, plot is to be uh, divided with the new dwelling positioned here and set back and then the garden uh, subdivided to provide uh, the area of garden space to serve the existing uh, property and then uh, garden space to serve the uh, proposed. Uh, and then there are to be two parking spaces provided. Uh, so these are new, all new parking spaces. So two will serve the existing property, which currently benefits from no off-street parking, and uh, two here will serve uh, the new dwelling. Uh, and then just some site photos. Uh, so this is the existing uh, N Terrace property. So it's uh, what was probably a former local authority uh, property, uh, sort of uh, post-war era construction. Uh, there is a, a listed building which is located on the other side of the road that, that runs down the side of the site. So the views of the conservation officer have been uh, sought on the proposal and I'll just come on to that in, in due course. Uh, this is a view taken uh, uh, from the uh, uh, the side of the of the property, looking back up the lane. So the um, the proposal will be located off located off this elevation here. There are some side windows in the existing property, which obviously would be affected by the proposal. Um, they this one serves a bedroom, but but that bedroom is also served by a window at the front, so that will still retain adequate natural light with the infilling of that window. Uh, this just serves a small toilet, uh, so only a very minor room. Uh, that, so um, there is a separate bathroom in that property. And again, uh, photos just looking back towards the property just for a sense of context. And then this one here just shows uh, an adjoining uh, area use for parking uh, of by neighbouring properties and it's adjoining adjacent that, that the new parking area would be sort of formed. And a, a couple of the photos just looking towards, I mentioned that the other end of the terrace had a property with a sort of setback, um, so which didn't quite uh, exactly continue the form of the terrace and so the proposal is to sort of to mirror that just to give a sort of balanced uh, approach. Um, uh, I We note that the um, terrace itself has chimneys and the application property doesn't have chimneys, but uh, uh, it's the set down and the mirroring of this property here, which has kind of dictated that sort of approach, which considers to be the more uh, correct approach in this circumstance uh, to deliver uh, a property without a chimney. So just to come on, just to the sort of policy background. So as I mentioned, it is within the settlement boundary of Chiltern Pold and where development is acceptable in principle, subject to consideration of its impacts. Um, so we just need to consider whether there's there's essentially visual harm and amenity harm that would arise as a result of the proposal. In terms of its scale, size, and design, it is a it's um, it's a three bedroom dwelling. Um, there it provides uh, appropriate garden space for both the existing and proposed. Um, it, as I mentioned, there is the offset, but we consider that to be the right approach. Generally, in terms of the design and the design treatment, things like the eaves and ridge heights, we will consider to be appropriate and relative to the existing properties there. Um, and the, the setback we would generally consider to be to be appropriate. So overall, um, in terms of size, scale and design, we consider it an appropriate response to the character of the street scene and existing properties. I mentioned about the listed building. Uh, it's a grade two listed building known as Langland House. Um, uh, so um, there is a, a side window proposed within the uh, application property at first floor, which would uh, be oriented in the direction of that property. It does only serve a landing. It's not what we would consider a habitable room, so we don't consider it's a window that would give rise to um, particular harmful overlooking as a result of that, even though it is oriented in the direction of the listed building. 
Um, so as I mentioned, there's two existing windows which would be lost from the, um, the host dwelling. Um, but the conservation officer's view was that they didn't consider there to be uh, harm that would give rise to the listed building. Um, they did want a materials condition uh, put on the uh, proposal just to make sure that the material choices were uh, acceptable to the local context and that materials condition is listed in, in, uh, in the conditions on the report. In terms of amenity impacts, um, the, uh, the proposal is for three bedrooms and that provides a gross total internal area of about 77 square meters. Now that does fall below national minimum uh, space standards, uh, which would see for a three bedroom property would expect to be about 84 square meters. Um, so the floor plans indicate that there are two double bedrooms and one single bedroom, and it's uh, primarily the single bedroom which measures below the requirements because that falls about a meter and a half below um, uh, and that falls below what the National Space Standard says should be for um, single bedrooms. The two double bedrooms are in, in excess of uh, that which would be required, but it is noted that there is a shortfall when compar compared with national standards. Now, those standards aren't standards that have been adopted by Sedgemore District Council. Um, there is a process when the local plan is adopted that national space standards have to go through if we wanted to include those in our local plan. So whilst they can be used as uh, useful benchmarks, they're not something that we could uh, always uh, rigidly impose on planning applications. Um, and we had noted that it would have been preferable for it to have been a two bedroom unit. Uh, that's something that officers had flagged up uh, uh, previously, um, but um, overall, given the the fact that the proposal provides adequate private external amenity space, all habitable rooms are served by natural light, the two double bedrooms are in excess of standards. Overall, we wouldn't consider that um, as sufficient to adequately um, warrant refusal of the application on amenity grounds. Just in terms of highways and parking, the 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 access is to be created off that side road, Langlands Drive, which is an unclassified no through road. Um, the existing dwelling has no parking. So as I stated, four off-road parking spaces are to be created uh, to serve the uh, proposal. Now, that will result in two spaces for the proposed, proposed dwelling and two spaces for the existing dwelling. Now, that is a shortfall when you look against the county parking standards because they would require three spaces per dwelling. Um, however, that Whilst that is an optimum level, what we have to take into account is the fact that at the present time, the existing property has no dedicated off street parking. So effectively, it has to park on the street. So this proposal, whilst only providing two per dwelling, is providing additional spaces that the current property doesn't actually have the benefit of. So we've had to weigh that into account uh, when coming to our recommendation in terms of actually providing abetment uh, and reducing some of the on street parking. Uh, uh, requirements. Uh, so we wouldn't consider overall the fact that there is a shortfall against the parking standard to warrant a refusal. Um, there is a condition which would be applied to any permission to ensure that spaces are however provided prior to first occupation of the dwelling. Uh, and just on ecological matters, um, there has been ecological surveying. Um, uh, there was um, uh, but, uh, county colleges had some concern there may have been potential slow worms on the site. That's been appropriately investigated and conditions and informatives are proposed on the application uh, appropriately, uh, securing a number of uh, things like enhancements, back box, uh, bee bricks, hedgehog friendly fencing. Uh, overall, therefore, subject to conditions, it's not considered that the proposed element would result in unacceptable impacts and our recommendation is for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, we have a speaker on this application. James Tadman, if you'd like to come forward. Good afternoon. Again, just reminding you, you've got the three minutes. You'll see the time on the clock and start whenever you're ready and we'll set the clock going. OK, dear members of the planning committee, I would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you in support of my application to construct a new dwelling at 88 Broadway, Tilton and Polden. I would also like to thank the planning officer, Emma Corley, for assistance with the application and for a balanced, supportive assessment and of the proposal and her recommendation for approval subject to conditions. The application for you is for a modest three bedroom dwelling that seeks to extend the terrace of dwellings in a way that reflects its existing character and has no harm on the street scene, setting of the nearby listed building or the immediate surrounding area. 
The planning officer and conservation officer have found the design to be entirely acceptable. The planning officer has confirmed that the proposal is acceptable in principle and only complies with the relevant local plan policies. The third bedroom is a bit on the small side when compared to the national space standards. However, it is easily be used as a study or simply a small bedroom. It is noted that the national space standards are not a policy requirement within the local plan, which is why the plan officer has found the size of the bedroom to be acceptable. Both the existing and proposed dwelling retain approximately sized gardens that are still larger than those in the development of Langland Drive at the rear. We have also set the fencing back from the side of Langland Drive and kept it low in order to retain openness and also visibility for the parking. With regard to the parking, 88 Broadway doesn't currently have any parking spaces, so we've designed it so both number 88 and the proposed dwelling have par two parking spaces each, which the planning officer has found to be acceptable. We have put the parking at the rear of the site, so it's off the main road, hidden at the back, and where the adequate level of visibility can be achieved. I note the concerns raised about the presence of slow runs on the site, but an ecological survey was carried out, which found no evidence of slow runs or any other protected species on the site. It is my intention to, to construct the dwelling and sell it on the open market, hopefully to a local family who needs a moderate sized dwelling. I know concerns from the local residents that the dwelling may be subject to change of use in the future. This is not my intention, but in any case, this would require a new application for planning permission for the council's decision. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you. And I hope you find my proposal acceptable and grant permission with conditions today. Thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions, please? Councillor Kingham. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's good to see that um, parking has been provided on this application because on that particular part of Broadway, it is very tight and there are a lot of traffic that uses that road. So that introduction of parking spaces is, is a good up, like, good for the site and for the properties. And obviously for travellers through Chilton Bow and, and uh, I'd like to move the recommendation. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from members, please? Then I'm looking for uh, that Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Although I'm not uh, overly keen on the size of the third bedroom, I will second the uh, motion. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. If there's no further comments or questions, we've had the recommendation moved and seconded to grant permission. All those in favour, please show. That's again unanimous, so it's clearly carried. Thank you. Uh, takes us to page 71 then, please, members, which moves us into Enmore. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ms. Elby, if you'd like to introduce this one, please. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so before we start, um, Councillor Caswell has um, since made a representation stating that he is in, um, fully in support of the application, as in his view, it does not detract in any way from the existing property. Sorry, I'll catch my breath back. <clears throat> OK, so the application is, is um, Laburnum Villa in Enmore, and the proposal is for a single storey extension to the south elevation. So this slide lists the uh, main considerations for this scheme alongside with the relevant policies from the local plan. So the site is in Enmore to the east of the school and to the west of the golf club. I think I've got that right way around. Yeah. Um, so the property lies to the north of the junction of Enmore Road and Andersville Road within a residential area. To the south and circled in purple, there are three grade two star listed buildings, which will be um, referenced to later on. So the site is this house, or wrong, this house up here. So the existing property is of a traditional appearance um, with a single storey, more modern extension to the side. 
The application seeks consent for the erection of a flat roof extension projecting from the front elevation. The proposal will have a flat roof, a roof lantern, and will be finished with render and an oak timber frame. It should be noted that there is a um, previously refused scheme for a single storey front extension. The scheme was refused for two reasons. Um, the first reason was that the projection from the front elevation was considered to be an incongruous form of extension to the detriment of the character of the existing dwelling, the surrounding street scene and the, the wider landscape. The second reason was um, due to the impact on the setting of the grade two star listed buildings um, to the south, which you saw on the previous slide. We then move on to photos of the site. So the um, the house, Laburnum Villa, is, is this property here. Um, so this is the view as you um, approach this part of Enmore. Again, as you get nearer to the site. Then when viewing the site from the um, junction opposite. We then move on to closer views of the property. Um, so you can see that the um, front has a sort of a Georgian Victorian character in terms of the window proportions and um, positions. The extension will be um, erected here. Oh, other screen, sorry, I keep pointing on the wrong screen. So in respect of impacts on visual amenity and landscape, the application site is in a prominent position as the site level was raised compared to the highway and is opposite a junction. The site, and in particular the part of the site where the proposed extension will be erected, can also be viewed from a distance on the approach to the hamlet. This prominence combined with the front projection is considered to be an inappropriate addition to the street scene, as the proposal would be an incongruous form of extension and would also erode the linear character of the Georgian style property. The previous application was refused due to the projection from the front elevation and this has not been amended. Additionally, the width of the proposed extension is wider than the side extent, the modern side extension to which it adjoins. And this combination of factors is considered to result in a detrimental impact on the character of the historic property and would erode the traditional Georgian face that characterises the property. In terms of the wider historic environment, there are three grade two star listed buildings to the south of the application site. And the conservation officer considers that the setting of these buildings would be harmed by the proposed extension. In respect of impacts on residential amenity, there are no concerns. However, due to the impact on the street scene, the listed buildings to the south and the character of the existing property, the proposed development is not considered to comply with policies D2, D19 and D26 of the local plan. And therefore, the officer recommendation is to refuse. Thank you. Again, we have a speaker on this application. So Simon Martin, would you like to come forward, please? Again, good afternoon. Welcome to the committee. You'll see there's three minutes on the clock. Start when you're ready and we'll uh, you'll hear the buzzer. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you will see that the conservation officer was the main objector to this application. <clears throat> um, it's, it's worth noting that the existing the listed building that we're talking about is more than 50 metres away and very well screened. Um, so I, I see that the one in the Chilton Polden just before was probably 20 metres away and that was considered no harm. Well, this one is 50 metres away, well screened. Um, the the people of uh, the people that live at Castle House have no objections. The Paris Council have no objections. The Ward Councillor is in support of application. Um, the conservation officer hasn't been to site, so it's worth noting that because I think if he'd have done so, he recommended that we moved the extension to each end elevation. Well, if it was moved to the end elevations, it would still be in view of the listed building, so therefore can't do any harm. But also if he had been to site, he would have seen that it, we can't move it to the end elevations because one is the front door and there's a garage on one end and the other end just simply doesn't have the room. So this is really the only place that it, it can be sited. Um, we, we have changed the design. Uh, Amelia Elvie asked us to change the original design. We had a tiled curtain around the, the original design and she actually asked us in an email to change it to this flat roof design, which is what we've done. So we have had dialogue. We've we've done everything we can and we're just a, a bit shocked why why it isn't going through. Um, the only other thing to note really is that they, we talk about the property have been historic 
Edwardian stroke Victorian, it's neither. It was two cottages, um, both villas. It was converted. We don't know exactly when, but we think in the 30s and made that front fa face has completely changed. So it's not a historic building at all. It's not in an area of outstanding natural beauty. It's not in a conservation area. So we just hope that you would look at it and support the application for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions, please? Thank you. Councillor Richards. Yes, thank you very much. As this isn't, as we just heard, in a conservation area, um, could you just tell us a, a, a bit more and expand on the screening that is there already and why when completing this extension it would have such a severe impact on, on, on the list of buildings which are quite a long way away in, in, in this part of the landscape. Thank you. Yep, sure. So um, in terms of screening, as you can see, there is um, some vegetation. Um, so these photos were taken um, recently. So I guess showing what it's like during the winter. There's no protection for this vegetation, so it could be removed without prior permission. Um, in terms of the listed buildings, I, I know you're, you know what you're saying about the distance. Um, that is only one of the reasons for refusal. So Reason two is relates to the potential impact on the listed buildings. Um, it's also considered to have a detrimental impact on the character of the, the property itself, as well as the listed building. So um, hopefully that clarifies things. Councillor Betty. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Amelia, can you just show me on this picture here whereabouts the proposed building is going to be, please? Uh, yeah, it's come. It's so it where that sort of modern single story extension is there. So it's going to be the width of that and slightly more about here. Because you can't hardly see that now. So it ha is it going to be um, from the plans? Is it, it doesn't look like it's going to be any taller than that bit anyway. Um, just moving. Uh, no, so it would be a similar eaves height. So yeah, it would be similar to the single store extension. I must admit, from my own point of view, I I understand the recommendation that we've got, particularly bearing in mind the report we've had from the conservation officer, but but I am struggling slightly in the sense of it is, is if this was a listed building itself, I have total agreement. I think, however, the fact this isn't listed, it's 60, Two meters, do you say? Well, sort of six sixty about yeah. meters from from where it is. We've seen the screening that's there at the moment, and I understand yes, that could go tomorrow, but that's in the control of the applicant. So one would imagine that wouldn't be something they'd want to necessarily do themselves. And I think the redesign, actually, from the first applicant, first design, has improved it enormously in terms of of keeping it down and low, uh, and therefore keeping it at that sort of eaves height rather than going up. I, I I would struggle, I must admit, to, to go with the recommendation as it stands at the moment, because I think it, it, whilst I understand where the conservation office has come from, I just don't think in this setting it has the impact that he is concerned about. But Mr Noon, did you want to comment? I mean, yeah, obviously, with there being two reasons for refusal, you could sort of disagree with us on one or both of them, um, leading you to sort of say delete the, ref, the, the reason for refusal you disagree with, but if you agree with us on the other one, then that would still lead us to a refusal, or obviously you could disagree with us on both reasons for refusal. Yeah. I think our concern on this one has always been this sort of conservatory type structure on the front of an attractive older property. That's very much as officers today, you know, the, sitting here today, that's our strong area of concern. Conservation officer felt very strongly about it. And the his reason for refusal went on the original application and obviously the same issues are engaged on this second application and we felt it would be inconsistent to just to walk away from that reason for refusal so it's it's here again for you to consider today and you disagree with us on one both or none of the reasons so okay yeah. councillor kingham thank you chairman yeah i'm say when you look at the proposed extension from the road is hardly visible. Um, I don't have a problem with that. The only thing I would like to see is maybe that the conservatory could be, you've got a Georgian style windows within the property. 
that maybe this conservatory could be more in keeping with that Georgian style, so it fit in a lot better. See, it's like I say, it's not a listed building, and it is on its own, so I don't have a lot of problem with this, and I would go along in grant permission for it if it could have a bit more character put into the conservatory itself. But maybe I haven't got that maneuverability on that. No, ultimately, we have the application that's in front of us to decide on today. Any further comments from members? Then I will be looking for a recommendation. Councillor Kingham. I'd like to move the recommendation to grant permission. Okay, the recommendation isn't a oh, grant no. at the moment, it's a refuse. So you'll be moving granting permission, but we would need planning reasons for which I guess in this instance, without putting words into your mouth, would in effect be the negative of what is the, the reasons for refusal that you don't think it has that impact on the dwelling or on the impact of the listed buildings. I don't think it has impact at all. Yeah. Okay. And were it to be granted, we would obviously need to make sure that there are suitable conditions to make sure that the standard conditions in terms of timing, materials, those sort of things would need to be covered as well? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is that proposal, Councillor Grimes? Yeah, totally agree, Chairman. Uh, happy to second this uh, application. Thank you. Okay. Anyone live at that point? Uh, Before we just, vote? Yeah. It just, yeah, the, the clear reason for approval, obviously, would be in an overturn and we should that clearly is basically a, the opposite of two reasons yeah. refusal, that it wouldn't have an adverse impact on the character of the existing building or the setting of the nearby listed building yeah and conditions we would obviously the time limit plans yeah. in terms of the materials i think it's fairly well specified application rendered so. to match um and detailing as shown on the drawing side unless members feel strongly about it i don't think we need to condition materials we Okay. What well, again, if members are happy that we just finalise those conditions to make sure they're enforceable and, and as such with Chairman and Vice Chairman, you happy with that? Okay, so we have that recommendation then is to grant permission subject to suitable conditions to be to be agreed with, with I'll say, Chairman and Vice Chairman. All those in favour of that, please show. That's unanimous, so that's clearly carried. Uh, members, I'm going to take, make a suggestion that if we take a short comfort break at that point because we're just over halfway through for this afternoon so if we break now and we'll restart at 10 past so that's eight okay it's 10 past so we'll make a start again um we move to the next application which is in the parish of Limpsham and Ms Elvey I think you're introducing one of our please thank you chairman so um this application land to the east of boat lane um, for the erection of a dwelling with detached garage slash workshop and provision of a community public open space the application is being heard at committee as the officer's recommendation is contrary to the view of the parish council. So this slide lists the um, relevant policies to this scheme along with side with the main considerations. So the site circled in yellow um, lies within the parish boundary of Limpsham, approximately a kilometre to the northeast of the village. The site itself lies to the east of Boat Lane, an unclassified road. To the um, west of the site is a residential area with the site surrounded by countryside in the other directions. So the application seeks consent for the erection of a detached dwelling with a detached garage building. The proposal also includes the donation of part of the land to the community to effectively extend the existing community space, which um, I'm not sure if you can read the annotation. So. The existing um, open space is this um, sort of field here. This is a Sedgemoor owned um, public open space. Was I on the right? Yeah, I was, sorry. <laughs> okay, so the proposed dwelling would have a hipped roof with gable detailing. The building is proposed to be finished with an oak frame, render, heritage bricks and traditional tiles. And this slide shows the proposed floor plans for the dwelling. The scheme also includes the erection of the detached um, garage workshop building. This um, proposed structure would have a pitch roof and uh, materials to match the dwelling. So we then move on to um, photos. So this is um, a view of the sort of the road which the um, site connects to. So where the um, 
red car is, is essentially the access. And then view from the um, other other side. So um, you first you go through one gate and then there's this sort of, um, I guess, grass um, area and then there's another gate. And then once you go through the second gate, you then see the site itself. So it's essentially bordered by those um, sort of trees you see in the in the background. And this views um, spanning round, so back towards the road. So this sort of um, this roof here is the sort of um, residential area on the other side of Boat Lane. So policy CO2 of the local plan supports infill housing in the countryside where it would be within a small village or hamlet that has a clearly defined nucleus of existing dwellings and the development would not physically extend the built form of the settlement into open countryside. In this case, the site's not considered to be within a clearly defined nucleus of existing dwellings and the proposal would introduce development to the east side of Boat Lane, constituting to an encroachment into the countryside. As such, the proposed would not comply with policy CO2. It is noted that the proposed scheme includes the provision of a community land. However, um, policy T3A of the local plan supports development that is outside but well related to settlement boundaries when such development provides local infrastructure. Additionally, policy D35 supports developments that provide additional community facilities. However, it's not considered that the creation of a community orchard in its own right would be objectionable in this location, but it is, the site is not considered to be well related to the settlement boundary and therefore the residential development could not be supported under policy T3A. It also doesn't um, comply with the other criteria that policy T3 sets out. So in terms of other issues, um, so in terms of the sequential testing, um, whilst in the report it refers to the applicant hasn't demonstrated a local connection to Lymphsham, um, I've had contact with the applicant and it could be demonstrated if needs be. It's just that information is yet to come forward. Um, so assuming that was to come forward, then the sequential test could be then passed in terms of flood risk um, because the, the dwelling would have to be built within Lymphsham in order to maintain that local connection that's required. Um, in terms of the exceptions test, the property is a two storey dwelling, so there wouldn't be um, concerns in respect of that. In terms of the um, other details of the proposal, the dwelling would be acceptable in respect of design and potential impact on neighbouring residents and the future occupiers of the property. The size of the plots also would allow for adequate level of off road parking and conditions could be used to ensure biodiversity enhancement. Nevertheless, the principle of the proposal is not considered to be supported by policy due to the unacceptable encroachment into the countryside and that the spatial aspects of the criteria set out by policy CO2 are not considered to be complied with. As such, the officer's recommendation is to um, refuse planning permission for two reasons. Um, so the first reason is that the erection of a dwelling in this location would not constitute infill development within a clearly defined nucleus and would extend development into the countryside. In terms of the second reason, this then goes back to um, the local connection. Um, it's not really an issue because the information could be provided, it just hasn't been yet. So the second um, reason relates to the sequential testing, the sequential test not being passed. Um, but if the local connection could be evidence, then that could be overcome. But nevertheless, the, um, the clash with the spatial um, criteria of CO2 isn't considered to be complied with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you'll see we've got a couple of speakers on this one. If we could start with uh, Councillor Gilling, if you'd like to come forward. Afternoon, Councillor Gilling. Just to remind you, you've got three minutes. Uh, you'll I'll try to remember that, Mr Chairman. Thank you. That's all right. You, you will see the time on the clock, so Thank start you. when you're ready, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to support, to offer my support for this pre extremely well designed and thought through process application. And I, I accept that it is, there are limitations to it, but nevertheless, the sequential test one passes in every respect, in my considered opinion. I can assure this committee that the applicant does have an extremely strong local connection in so far that the family to which, to which he is attached created the Sanders superstores that we now see both in Brent Knoll under a different ownership, admittedly, 
but its foundation was on this site where now dwellings exist. And they, to my untutored and unqualified opinion, create form as a nucleus of a small um, residential development. I can confirm again that the local connection is strong in so far that as a, poor, a potato grower of poor record, I have traded with the family in this question and by selling them potatoes for their own resale. So I have a long standing connection with the family in that respect. And as ward member, I represent them today. I also feel, Mr Chairman, quite strongly that this application has got a deja vu written all over it, in so far that it is extremely similar to the previous application we saw in the same parish and under the same case officer's recommendations. There's been no, rec or no adherence to any form of pragmatism, because this is a site which is clearly in need of some sort of development, bearing in mind its planning history in so far that there is an extant planning application for greenhouses, packing sheds and uh, officer um, staff rec or re recreation, but staff accommodation of some description to accommodate the staff. I think it should be noted that this is, it'd be perfectly practical for the applicant to construct such a property if it was to be done this way, sell it on the, the open market Anybody taking up that option could then revert to the extant planning application and create the greenhouses that were proposed for. And the support that's been offered by the local residents who've been questioned unanimously support the idea of not encouraging the greenhouses to be built on their, their territory. And consequently, I feel that they should be allowed the opportunity to have a say in what's being said, and it's a unanimous support for this application, as was the Parish Council's unanimous support for it, to a well put case by the applicant. I can really say a lot, a lot, a great deal more, but I have now got Councillor, you can't say anything more, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> You're out of time, Councillor. Thank you very much. I try. Chris Sanders, if you'd like to come forward, please. Again, just remind you, you've got the three minutes. You'll see the time on the clock. Please start when you're ready. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me this time to speak to you. This site currently has planning permission for 12,000 square feet of commercial greenhouses and a commercial pack house. This would be a significant development by any measure and an enterprise that would require transport for distribution and many other frequent vehicle movements. Exceptionally, we are asking for this existing planning permission to be revoked and for permission for a single dwelling and garage to be granted in its place. We're proposing to build an attractive house designed to be appropriate to the area in both scale and character. The site is already screened by mature trees and with the planned extensive planting, landscaping and rewilding, the site will deliver major wildlife benefits. On top of this, we will enter into a 106 agreement to donate and establish a community orchard. The new orchard will more than double the area of the existing local facility. Your officer's report originally stated that we're not on the self-build register and that we failed to demonstrate a local connection to Limpshin. As you've heard, this is not correct. In Somerset villages, as most of us know, you are not a local until you have at least two generations buried in the churchyard. Well, Mr Chairman, <clears throat> I do have two generations in the churchyard. My parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles are all buried in Limpsham Church. I myself was born and raised in Limpsham, and for more than 40 years my family ran the local shop, Sanders Country Store. Nowadays, my stepson is a landscaper living in Limpsham. <clears throat> Our grandson attends Limpsham Preschool and soon we hope will our granddaughter. We have actually been on the self-build register for more than a year, and I believe this does resolve the sequential test issue. I'm pleased to tell you that our plans have been well received locally. We have received strong support from both Limpsham Parish Council and local residents, who of course will benefit from the reduced traffic movements and a greatly improved neighborhood amenity. 
I don't believe there have been any objections from members of the public, nor have there been any objections from the usual statutory bodies. Under these circumstances, I hope you'll find that surrendering of an existing planning permission to be a material reason to approve our application. Mr Chairman, members of committee, I ask please that you exercise flexibility and consider that on its merits, this application should be approved. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Members, any comments or questions? I've got Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, this, as pointed out already, is a carbon copy of a case we had before at Lynsham. Uh, the only difference is this chap is not uh, what's called agricultural worker. That is really the only difference here. Same village, same plan, everything about it is exactly the same. I've gone through the details here twice. I've looked through the whole thing, read it all back to front, so I don't have to trawl over information that's been said already. The commercial, uh, prop the commercial adventure, which is uh, under 1,200 square feet, hasn't been finished, but the application is still live, but that's to be withdrawn and the house put in its place. They want to give land back to the council. I don't know, it's a dog walking area for children to play, whatever the case may be, and they want to build an orchard as well. So they can't do enough for the village and what they're doing. Local connections, which we spoke about, uh, I just heard the applicant just say just now that I, in actual fact, he, he's got plenty of local connections. There's no problem on that at all. Going down through um, the, the highways, standing advice, uh, no objections. Uh, drainage board, standing advice, no objections. In fact, there's nothing at all. Parish Council's on board with this and want to see it done. Nine neighbours, I'm, I'm not trying to repeat everything it was said, but just a, nine different neighbours apparently uh, not only didn't object, they've sent in letters to actually support this as well. Uh, the environmental, everything's okay with that. The, there's no abhorrent comments at all from any single person or body, absolutely nothing. And I just heard the case officer say something just now about uh, local connection, if they can prove that, that might tip the balance one way or another. Now, again, I, I do stress, I'm not, I'm not going to just keep going over everything you said, but this plot of land can be built on is exactly the same as the case before. And if we go to page 78, paragraph 3, I think it is, the uh, Limsham Parish Council support the application for a thoughtfully planned residential dwelling. Uh, the applicant addressed the Parish Council, the community orchard. So he's this applicant has done everything he possibly can. There is there's nothing adverse I can say about this. Now you put, you could probably go down the road and say policy C01, policy justification. The he has actually justified that why he wants the house. I want to take away uh, a commercial property, a commercial adventure which is there and build on the land which has already been started built on. There's an issue, I think, with parking to make three parking bays or something like that. I'm not sure I read something about that, but I shouldn't, a plot of land that size, that wouldn't present any problem of any kind. Uh, and he said he, he owned the garden centres, which was all local. And I've just heard him say just now he's got family actually buried in the, in the parish. So that's the way it is. I've got absolutely no problem with this whatsoever. Nothing. There's nothing negative I can say here. And as I've said before about this, as a planning committee, we have to be transparent, robust and fair. If we turn this down here today, we're not being either of those things, not any of them at all. This should absolutely 100% be granted permission. No doubt in my mind whatsoever about that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Noon or Ms Elvie, do you want to comment at all at that point? I would just like to add that um, the local connection issue relates to the um, sequential test for the for flood risk. In terms of policy CO2, there is five bullet points that sets out the criteria that development should relate to, um, should comply with. <laughs> One of them is refers to having to comply with a self build policy, um, but the other ones all relate to sort of spatial aspects and the pattern of development. And I think that's that's the reason for the first reason for refusal is because it's the officer's view that it doesn't comply with that that part of the policy. Okay, thank you, Mr. Noon. Just uh, quickly to come back on a couple of points that were made by speakers, the extent permission. Um, we do refer to that in the report as being uh, potentially extant. Um, as far as I'm aware, we've not confirmed that position. Um, it was a 97 permission, a renewal of a 92 permission. Um, it is, I would stress though, it's greenhouses, it's agriculture. That doesn't make this a brownfield site. 
it is still greenfield, even if that is built out. So our, yeah, and I, I hear the points very loudly about the local connection. I don't doubt that this gentleman can demonstrate a local connection that would address the self-build requirements and automatically address the second reason for refusal on the basis of flood risk. If you have a local connection, the only land available was in, in high levels of flood risk, the sequential test is, would be passed at that point. Exceptions tests, we can tell from the design of the house is, is met. That I think falls away very quickly, which does bring us back to the spatial requirements. And we need to be able to demonstrate that we have a scheme that is compliant with policy CO2. And the key bullet points is, is it infilling? Is it between other development? Um, is it sort of maintaining and enhancing the sustainable patterns of development? Development which physically extends the built form of settlement into the countryside. You can see the pattern of settlement there. This is the judgment you have to make. Our, our view as officers is that area circled in yellow there is outside the pattern of development and it, it would extend, in our opinion, the built form. Um, scale and nature of development is, is appropriate. Well, a single dwelling, I think we, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not, it's not a scheme for 20 houses or anything like that. So a single house, we're not raising a particular strong issue there with. Um, and we're not saying that there's any fundamental landscape issues it comes back to the, those bullet points, which are two and three of policy CO2. Is this infilling? Is it between existing development or is it extending the development into the countryside? Those, I think, are the key points you need to grapple with. Um, I would set aside the fact that there is an extant permission on that because that is for agricultural development, which isn't going to create a brownfield site, even if it were built out. Um, just by way of indication of what that is, um, the layout plan has the a dotted line um, to keep going, keep going, keep going. Where's the layout plan of the house there? That red shape there under the parking area there is the, the outline of the approved greenhouses. Quite possibly, if that land that is now public open space has formally been provided and adopted and is now, that is the lawful use of that part of the site, that would extinguish that permission. That's why I say there is a doubt about that. I don't know if that permission can still be implemented. No. I, it was that. Not sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, because it, it's within the red line. Yeah. Apologies. So that is that is a permission there. It is claimed to be extant. We haven't done the digging. Apologies for get, for, for misreading from where my poor eyesight from here. Um, so that permission is there. It may be extant. We haven't had a certificate of lawfulness or anything more concrete to demonstrate that. Um, so, yeah, but it comes down to the spatial. Okay. Issues. Just if, if I, I I'll comment as because I'm obviously a ward member for this as, as well. Um, in terms of I think your final phrase was whether it's concrete that, that it, physically it is concrete because there, there is a concrete pad that went in um, uh, many years ago because obviously it's covered this patch for a while. Um, as, as other mem well, as it's been stated, I mean, the, when you look at the plan that members have on their papers in front of them, you see Ferry Lane, which I think has been referred to. That was that was the site of the original Sanders store plus their parking, which then became the housing that's there now and the public open space that's outside the red line was donated as part of that development for the residents of that area to be able to use. Um, so the, the comments within the report about this being a mile outside the village centre is absolutely right. But of course, that public open space is there serving those residents who are, are that distance from the centre, so they have something that they can use without having to cross the, the A370. Um, in terms of the extant permission, um, it was greenhouses, but it was also packing shed um, and other associated works um, so I think you'll find that that, that I think my, my feel on this would be I, I agree with the, the CO2 there are a couple of issues there that, that this is outside of but I don't think as things stand at the moment if we take into account other material considerations which I do believe um, CO3 and the use of that land as an extant permission which which is there um, is material and that should be taken into consideration and if and the surrender of that potential commercial use uh, is something that i think we could look at um 
also, as we mentioned, the uh, the particular applicant with the connections and the fact that it is self build whilst this is not under CO2, I think that is again a material consideration that we could look at uh, as to to this particular site. Um, reference was made about introducing development on the other side of boat lane. There are existing dwellings on that side. They are sporadic, but there are development uh, on that side of, of boat lane. Uh, and as, as was being said, the, uh, the sequential element drops away when we when we deal with uh, the fact that this is uh, a self. Well, it is self build and it is someone who has those local connections. I think, as others mentioned, it is it is a well designed scheme. Uh, there is community benefit in terms of the the community orchard. Uh, uh, we've heard also that there is substantial rewilding and benefits for the uh, the ecology of that area. And I believe from reading within the report, there are elements of uh, there was a concern I think raised by environmental health because of air source heat pump. So again, we're using environmentally friendly sorts of heating in that area. So I think there are a number of other material considerations that that weigh in my own mind positively towards this application, um, which I do understand the recommendation in terms of CO2. It isn't in a nucleus as an infill. It's close to a very big nucleus, but it's the wrong the wrong uh, area to be an infill. So at the moment, I'm, I'm still minded to uh, to hear the debate. Um, but my own view at the moment is I think there are material considerations that we can take into account on this that uh, that would weigh in its favour, particularly with conditions and the section 106, I think, that was called for by the parish council in terms of the public open space uh, community orchard facility. Uh, looking for any other comments at the moment, I'll come to Councillor Betty next. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm wavering on this one at the moment. Um, what I don't um, fully like is the idea of if we don't have this you're having um the greenhouse and that i don't like when we seem to go that way it doesn't sit well with me that you either have this or you're having this chucked at us i don't i don't like that being put upon us um on Limsham's parish council's comments there is um a comment about the section 106 agreement um, about the future maintenance and it not being the sole responsibility of the parish council. Now, will this be put in so that it's not the sole responsibility for the parish council, or will they actually have the sole responsibility of this new orchard and public open space, which they seem not to want their responsibility of? Could, could I make a comment on that? Only in the sense of the public open space that's there at the moment is not the responsibility of Limpsham Parish Council. It's this council because it was turned as one of as a 106. But Ms. Alvey? Um, yeah, I was just going to add to that that it's Sedgemore owns the current um, public open space that's next to it. In terms of um, who would be responsible, I guess that would it gets all thrashed out if a section 106 was going to if we were going down that route, it would be looked into. To do. And normally, when we take on formal open space as part of development, we expect to commute it some, depending on the nature of the layout and what is being offered. May not be appropriate here, but just wouldn't want to rule it out yeah. if that's what you know, is, is necessary. But we would have we had open spaces officers' views on this one? No, no. So I think we probably you know, we would bring them in to advise us. Okay. Mr. De Vries from the mm. from the cheap seats. Would you like to join us? I, I do apologise, and I was really trying not to get involved. Um, can you just go to the layout plan where you've got the L-shaped footprint of the building? Just because I want to make sure that members are giving appropriate consideration to the material considerations in this case. So, the background planning permission, the additional packaging and storaging area, is the small square at the front of that building. So the rest of that footprint is all greenhouses. So in the national planning policy framework, agricultural development is greenfield. So even if it was commenced, it's still a greenfield site. And given the footprint of the packaging area, that would be considered to be ancillary to the agricultural use of the building. Um, so I just wanted to make sure if, if you are taking into consideration your his, the history of the site, you know, you are fully aware of where that sits with the National Planning Policy Framework. Um, and I forget the second point I want to make, but I will leave it to members to carry on debating. Sorry, thank you. Councillor Hendry. 
Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Could you go back to the aerial plan, showing all the properties um, on the, the uh, well, there was another one than that, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right, stop now. Very plain for all to see. It's not an infill. It's not what's called nucleus of time. However, we have before that this committee passed exactly the same. Something outside a nucleus of ten or not an infill. This is not so far outside that 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 anybody could put up a big fight and uh, fight or an argument about this. All the properties on the other side of the road, on the west side, slightly to the north, and I think there's even one to the south there. That little red square is that an old property? So they're they're all within that that kind of framework. I stand by what I said earlier. I have no problem whatsoever. Now I know there's a few rules to bend there, green fuel, brown fuel. I, I understand all that, I get it fully, but bottom line, I'm okay with this, no problem whatsoever. And I recommend we actually grant permission. Thank you. Okay, I'm looking for other comments, questions from members. Councillor Kingham. Um, could you say where the village envelope actually is where the boundary will be um yeah i don't have a plan of it but it's um closer to the actual village of limpsham so um look down here so there, there's no yeah. settlement boundary there's no bound there's no, no. boundary no. so it's not outside therefore it's no boundary it's not outside of it it is outside of it by some distance there's no boundary the boundaries down in but around limpsham yeah <laughs> I think you want to say yeah, I just wanted well. to say something after um, Councillor Hendry that the scheme that you're referring to, the other uh, Limpsham one, I, I would argue that that, is diff that was different because it was for a rural worker as well as being a self-build. Um, and in terms of the pattern of development, I note your point about um, there being houses on that side of the road, but this proposed house is quite further east compared to those buildings, so it's you know approximately there, um, just to sort of help clarify a few things. Yes. Thank you, Chairman. This is a difficult one, isn't it? Of, um, the reason for refusal uh, number two, the, the sequential test and local connection has seemed to um, now be overridden. And the notion of a community orchard included in this is, is an attractive one. And uh, given there are houses along that side of the road, although you've explained they're sort of closer to the road and not so far out. Is there any way to sort of beef up the um, the 106? Because I'm, I'm the thing that concerns me on the mention of the community orchard is that the local parish council don't seem to want to take ownership of that. And they would seem to be the, the obvious body to do so. Um, my concern is if passed that the, the notion of a residential orchard gets lost in 106 negotiations and then nobody wishes to take control responsibility for it. Are there, I'd be grateful for any comments around that, please. Um, yeah, I mean, with section 106, as they normally set out the process for which um, public open space can be transferred and who to, so there would be sort of conversations had. Um, I mean, in terms of the community orchard, I guess it's, you have it, the consideration has to be made about whether or not that outweighs the harm of this development taking place in this location. Yeah. And if I could just add to that, that we, we've got two different possible three, if you include brownfield land, greenfield land. But the justification for this, we need a policy that allows for a dwelling in the countryside outside of settlement limits, which policy CO2 currently tells us we should refuse it. Rural, the rural dwelling, rural workers dwelling isn't being advanced in this case. It, it's relying on some other policy. Policy CO2 is the obvious one because that allows for infill development in settlements that don't have settlement boundaries. And as we've said, we feel that this fails on a couple of the bullet points of CO2 in terms of being outside. It's not infill between development. It, we think it extends beyond. Now, those are the only criteria for CO2. Um, if you are looking at the benefit, notional benefit arising from the additional land for the public open space, that doesn't fall naturally under CO2 unless 
we rely on the text below the bullet points um, to maintain or enhance the vitality of rural rural communities. It would normally expected that any new any proposals contribute to supporting existing services where appropriate. Um, I think that's quite tenuous to say that the open, additional open space is supported by policy CO2. And I think it's, as we've said, we don't feel that the residential justification follows that well at all. So if we go back to policy T3, that deals with development outside, but well related to the settlement boundary. And as we say, the settlement boundary is around the main cluster of Limpsham, not here. Um, but there is a line in CO in in, sorry, in T T3 that does sort of um, where is it? Just looking for the exact wording of it. Development that appropriately contributes to local infrastructure or priorities identified, for example, in neighbourhood plans or in agreement with parish councils. But that's neat with this other stuff. Yeah. So that is, you know, if someone came forward outside of Lippenshun but next to the settlement boundary with something for the community, there's a strand that supports that. But this isn't well related. So it's very difficult to say to conflate the two to say that as a package this is worth having because we rely on the support of two different policies that don't squarely support the scheme overall and you know the fact that the parish aren't willing to adopt it makes me doubt their commitment to it um yeah that's not to say they don't welcome it but they don't want to be responsible for it but it, it does sort of in the back of my mind it's thinking well is this an infrastructure priority that has been identified locally um, and then, so that that's the other policy justification. The other, the final policy justification, which I don't think is open to you today, is 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 this a good reuse of brown, previously used land, brownfield, and the packing element of it isn't sufficient for the overall building to be viewed as 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 a commercial use. It was a greenhouse to supply plants to the garden centre, so that would be horticulture, which is in planning speak agriculture so that line of support for this particular scheme i don't think is available to you um so i'm sorry if, you know to make those points but you know just to really amplify what we've said in the in the report can i just ask a question in terms of that co3 policy um totally accept what you're saying in terms of this is a, a agricultural use is a is a glass house or a greenhouse but we are talking about 12, I think it was the figure was given 12,000 square feet of of buildings that would be glass house, yes, but they are still, I mean, we're talking about, we're not talking about a little greenhouse in the corner of here, we're talking about really substantial industrial size development. The substantial footprint indicated on this plan here. So what's that, six, seven times footprint of this house in the house? Is but also with CO3, that um, where the employment use is being lost, there has to be a, a demonstration that it's no longer viable, as well as you know the other other things. I've got. I think was it Councillor Grimes had his hand up. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. A uh, very difficult one, this. Um, but I think it's time to move this on. Um, I have to agree with the local connection. Um, but I believe we have to be consistent on encroachments in the countryside and the officer's reason to refuse. So in this case, I'm going to move the recommendation to refuse permission on this. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Kingham. Chairman, um, we've had a document which has been approved, which is the local plan. And on that local plan, it has various conditions where and where you can't build. And one of them is building outside an open countryside. And to me, this is what this application is. So I would go along with Councillor Grimes and I would go along with the officer's recommendation to refuse. OK. Are there any further comments or questions that members have before we go to a vote? Because we have a, a recommendation that has been proposed and seconded. So the recommendation that's before us is to refuse permission because, and I presume, are we looking at reason one only or are we looking at both? OK. Thank you very much. So that's based on the, the two reasons that are on your papers before you today. Uh, all those in favour of that refusal, please show. 
two, three, four, five, six. Six and seven. And those against, please show. Two against. So that is clearly carried. So that is permission refused. Six to two to naught. OK, thank you very much. That brings us to the next application, which is on page 84. Um, we're at North Petherton uh, in Moon Lane. So we have um, Ms. Elvey again, please. <laughs> yeah, me again. Last one for me today, though. <laughs> so um, this application is at Parsons Farmhouse um, in Moon, Moon Lane, North Petherton, for the conversion of a cider house barn to a dwelling. The application is being heard by committee as the applicant is an elected member. So this slide lists the relevant policies from the local plan alongside with the main considerations. So the application site lies within the parish of North Petherton um, between the villages of North Newton and Thaluxton. The application site consists of a number of agricultural buildings sited to the south of Moon Lane and Unclassified Road. The site is surrounded by countryside and there are some residential dwellings to the east. So the existing building is a single storey structure finished with rendered walls and clay roof tiles. And the application seeks to consent, seeks consent to convert the building to a one bedroom property. Minimal external changes are proposed with only the size of a window on the rear elevation slightly increasing. The proposal replicates the previously approved but now expired scheme um, in 20, from 2018. So this is a um, Google Street View image. I use this because of the sort of wide angle lens just to give you a good um, sort of idea of the street scene there. So um, this is the oh, wrong slide. This is the building subject to the application um, with this access being the existing access and the one that's going to be used. Um, and then this is a view from the south, so the other side of those buildings. So you can see the residential properties there and then the, the building itself subject to the application. So the application site is in a countryside location. However, the NPPF supports development in such locations that reuses redundant buildings. As the proposal relates to the conversion and reuse of an existing building, the principle of the proposal is considered compliant with policy CO1 of the local plan. In respect to the visual amenity of the proposal, minimal changes um, are put forward to the external experience, appearance of the property. The building is an adequate distance from neighbouring properties to not give rise to an unacceptable impact on the amenity of neighbouring residents. And the accommodation proposed is acceptable in respect of the amenities of future occupiers. The proposed dwelling would have access to an adequately sized parking area and the proposed use would utilise the existing vehicular access. The application has been accompanied with a BAT survey, which has been updated since the um, since 2018, and appropriate conditions would be used to ensure adequate mitigation and biodiversity enhancement. It is for these reasons that the officer recommendation is to approve planning permission with appropriate conditions. Thank you. Good afternoon again. If you start when you're ready, you'll see the time on the clock. Good afternoon, Chairman and members. The application before you is supported by the case officer, and I would ask for your support and approval of the barn conversion scheme, which was previously granted planning permission. The scheme remains unaltered from that originally consented. It is a testament to the community minded character of the applicant, your fellow councillor, that he put the interest of his constituents over that of his own investing much time on others rather than his own affairs and regrettably allowed the permission to lapse. This, re this resubmission for the barn conversion is as before compliant with the local plan policies prevailing and therefore I ask that you endorse the officer's recommendation and grant planning permission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions please? Yes, Councillor Betty. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I would hope that the um, applicant would use those two words that he keeps going on to us about common sense and this time actually uh, start the building. Um, I don't see a problem with this and I'll happily support the recommendation. Was that a proposal? Okay. Any further comments, questions? 
Is there a seconder for that? Councillor King or more? Well, obviously we've, we've approved it in the past and it's exactly the same as it was before. So I think that we can't go against our original decision. So I'm happy to second it. Okay. I'm not seeing any other comments from anyone. So we have the recommendation to grant permission. Uh, those in favour, please show. Unanimous. That's clearly carried unanimously. So permission granted. And we move to page 90 uh, into Othery. And welcome back, Mr. Titchener. That's right. Just hold on one minute. Okay. Right, Mr. Titchener, if you'd like to. All right, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, so, uh, this is an application. It's for the retention of an agricultural building. It's located at Orchard Farm at Bedwell Lane in Othery. Um, it's before members due to the objection of the Paris Council. Uh, so, this is Othery here. This is the application site. So, on the sort of very northern fringe of the village, comprising sort of the yard area, a number of agricultural buildings. Uh, so this is the uh, location plan showing the red line of the site. So the actual building is located in here. Um, the site is served by sort of a, an access track uh, that spurs off of them. Uh, the main road uh, to the north of the settlement and they have a number of existing agricultural buildings and a temporary agricultural workers dwelling on site. Um, so the building is both in this location, it uh, is attached to an existing building uh, located here. And I mentioned they have some other agricultural buildings on site, which are these uh, located here and here. So um, the, this is the building in terms of its sort of design. It's a typical modern agricultural uh, design. So timber boarding of a block uh, with a grey fibre cement roof. So a pretty typical. Uh, it measures 24 by 30 metres. It's got an eaves height of uh, just under five metres and a ridge of 7.5. So its proposed use is for the storage of machinery, fodder and straw for bedding. Um, the applicant runs a, um, their enterprise involves calf rearing. Um, so it's very specific. Uh, so calves are brought onto site at a week to 10 days old. They are reared on site until they're about 12 weeks old, and then they're sent away. Another another batch brought in. Uh, so that's that's the nature of the business. That and it's that business which has also supported us previously granting a temporary agricultural workers dwelling. That process continues throughout the year. So at any one time, there's generally about 100 calves on site. And in the calendar year, the applicants identify that they generally have in excess of about 400 passing through through the site. Machinery was previously kept outside uh, and feed was kept in a much smaller pole barn. Uh, so this building will give the applicant much more uh, dedicated uh, storage, uh, increasing the longevity of equipment and materials. Uh, so we are satisfied in terms of the need for the building on the enterprise. Um, these photographs are of the building. So this is the building um, here. The frame and the roof are on. The building is not yet clad. That's that's to be added. You can see here it's already in its storage use, storing uh, fodder crops for, for the cars on site and attached to the existing building. As you can see, it's a fairly typical agricultural design. Uh, in terms of, sort of wider views, um, the site has existing hedgerow and tree brown boundaries, which provide a degree of screening when seen from outside. Uh, so as you can see here, so views taken, uh, that's the ridge line. Uh, so showing above the, the hedgerow, uh, taking from the, the lane. Again, you can see it seen against the context of the existing farm buildings. There's some trees that provide some screening here. 
the, the, the landscape is flat, uh, which sort of helps contain the building within the site. Uh, a couple of other photographs just showing some of the screening and evidence. The lower photograph taken from uh, closer to the main road in the village, looking across a couple of fields. Again, you can see it. You can just see the roofscape just peeping above the, the, the hedgerow. But in our view, not something that gives rise to any sort of wider landscape or visual effects. It's not. It's a fairly typical building that people would expect to see on agricultural units in the countryside. Uh, so just to come on to uh, other, relate, other related matters, concern had been expressed by the Paris Council about drainage proposals for the site. The site is in flood zone three, as is much of the surrounding area, and the Paris were concerned that soakaways would not be suitable due to clay soil uh, uh, and that that wasn't appropriate mean, uh, means of drainage. So the application has sat with us for a little while while the applicant has commissioned a drainage consultant to put together a drainage strategy for the site. So site conditions were uh, examined uh, and they uh, put together a scheme that now proposes two above ground attenuation tanks. So that's these two tanks shown, shown here. Uh, the size of the tanks has been calculated relative to the size of the roof to be drained. They will then discharge in, uh, via a pipe to the adjoining watercourse at a controlled rate. Uh, the council's drainage officer has reviewed these proposals and now considers them to be an acceptable means of drainage for the proposal. So we would seek to secure that, that uh, drainage scheme via a condition uh, to be attached to the permission. Just in terms of other matters, in terms of the means, the impacts of very few nearby dwellings. Um, it's a storage use that's proposed that's not being proposed for, for livestock, for example. So it's not something that we would consider gives rise to uh, amenity, uh, amenity impacts, uh, largely that equipment's already being stored on the site. This just gives it a covered place within which to put it. And so highways have raised no concerns, um, and they basically consider that it doesn't is unlikely to give rise to significant rise in vehicle movements. Like I said, it's just storing what's already there. Um, in terms of ecology, lastly, uh, Natural England commented on the application. They had no concerns providing the building, uh, or no concerns as the building wasn't being used for livestock. Um, so. Um, Conditions are proposed to control lighting uh, and another to secure bat and bird boxes to be attached to the permission, but uh, that would, in our view, uh, satisfy all ecological considerations. So um, in summary, uh, we would consider the need for the building to be justified to support the growth of the business. Um, we do note the concern for the Parish Council, but subject to the conditions, uh, we consider the proposal is acceptable and therefore our recommending permission is granted. Thank you much. Let's just see, we have a couple of speakers on this one. So Andrew Tizard, if you'd like to come forward first of all, please. And just to confirm you're speaking on behalf of the Parish Council today. OK, start when you're ready and you'll see the time. Thank you, Chairman. Ozer is a rural village with numerous working farms and support of our agricultural community is the heart of the village ethos and defines us as a community. However, our concerns have been raised about the development, development widely the size and scale in the original application dated December 2020 stated that the site encompasses an area of eight hectares. This is a vast overstatement of its actual size, which is correctly stated in another planning application made later to the Council on July 2021, where it's stated as being 0 0.17 of a hectare. As such, we feel that the size is disproportionate to the small holding. Use and future expansion. The applicant states that the barn is of the size required to allow for storage of vulnerable agricultural equipment, procurement of additional animal feed, fodder and bedding materials. However, since completion over the last month, months, the barn has been used for storage of a large Bridgewater Carnival float, the presence of which has been partly obscured by a hay bale wall. It is suggested that if spare space inside exists for such stories, this illustrates the barn is oversized for the farm's needs. As for future expansion, in the later planning application dated July 21, the applicant states there are no plans to expand the farm. Flood potential. We are pleased that the applicant and agent have recognised the position of the development within flood pane three. However, we dispute their assessment of the rainwater management, which we've had assessed. Whilst it is stated a 15,000 litre attenuation tank we used to collect the rainwater, it is, this is inadequate. Environment Agency Weekly Bulletin for the 28th of December 22 to the 3rd of January 23 states that in the worst affected region, southwest Somerset Levels area, 53 millimetres of rain fell. 
use an accepted algorithm equation to assess rainfall collection of a roof which is uh, stated as 756 square meters. This would collect with a 10% loss, which would still go into the ground somewhere in the region of 36,000 litres of water, way in excess of the attenuation tank. If you look at December 22 as a whole in the Somerset area, this would be in somewhere in around 95,000 litres. With global warming and unusual weather anomalies becoming the norm, there is a serious concern that this development, if allowed, would cause risk of flooding to the two residential dwellings immediately near the property, one business and smallholder immediately to the west. The applicant discusses siphon of water off the nearby rings, which are minor. Character and setting, we're concerned that although that the nearest listed building is close, the MPPF and O3 design statement does actually allow and require the looking into uh, the heritage setting of other buildings. We believe this application should be refused. Thank you. Thank Sorry, you. Sorry, I rushed you. I've got an awful lot. No worries. Thank you. James Venton, if you'd like to come forward, please. Again, start whenever you're ready, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, afternoon, members. Um, thank you for allowing me an opportunity to speak with you. Um, before I mention the merits of the proposal, I just wanted to clarify a little about how the application has come about today. Um, often when something is applied for retrospectively, um, it brings about furrowed brows and light shaking of heads, suggesting something untoward is afoot. Um, certainly not the case here. Um, initially, a 28-day notification application was submitted and permission given for the building. At the time of submission and point of determination, the applicant met the requirements of such a submission. However, after construction started, it was picked up that the applicant had surrendered a few acres of land, which dropped in below the threshold. Anyway, after a lot of discussion with the council, it was decided the best way to uh, tidy the situation up would be to submit a full application. Um, I've been involved in this site for, well, 10 or 15 years on and off, I should think, and I've seen uh, the applicant develop this site um, from virtually nothing into what it is today, which is a very tidy, well-run, organised little farmstead. Um, the supporting justification for the application, which has been put forward in the form of an agricultural appraisal, um, provides full justification for the, the size and scale of the building. We've had issues with regards to flood risk, which, um, as the case officer quite rightly says, has been um, addressed by a professional consultant. Um, we take on board the comments of the chairman from the parish, but as I say, the report's been prepared by a professional, so we can only really go on, on what they're telling us. Um, the building's proportional. What more can I say? It's an agricultural holding, and this is for this application is for an agricultural building. Um, the case officer con con concurs with um, the fact that justification has been proved. Uh, as I say, a couple of matters pertaining to ecology and flood risk have been raised and addressed and accordingly secured um, uh, by planning condition. We respectfully request, therefore, that members follow their officer's recommendation to grant permission and allow this now well-established rural enterprise the opportunity to continue to grow. Thank you. Thank you. Again. No worries. Just before I come to to members, uh, Mr. Tetra, there was a couple of issues raised about and addressed by both speakers. The the size of the attenuation tanks. If you could just address that, and also the potential use of the uh, of the site for non agricultural purposes. Okay. Just um, in terms of the attenuation tanks. Um, I mean, I think I kind of mirror the comments of the agent in that we we've, we've had a professionals professional drainage consultants report come in, and that has been reviewed by our own specialist uh, drainage uh, uh, internal consultee who is satisfied and having just had a quick look back through the report I do notice they have included some allowances because they worked out the roof space at 750 square meters but made calculate the tanks on the basis of 900 square meters and have a bit of flexibility in there so I'm guided by the fact that they've they've, they've allowed some headroom and our our experts you know in, in drainage are telling us it's okay so i think we do have to defer to, to their advice in terms of the the use of the building for non-agricultural purposes well i mean the, the building the use being put forward is for agriculture um uh so if the applicant is putting it to other uses they obviously put themselves at the risk of, of enforcement action it would only have if permission is granted it would only have permission for agricultural purposes and uh to vary from that um, would either need an application in future and which would be considered on its merits or put the applicant at risk of enforcement action thank you okay thank you very much councillor riches 
Um, to me, this is a sort of typical agricultural building that one would expect to see in, in, in such a landscape. Um, Mr. Titchener, can you, could you just clarify, there have been different um, holding sizes um, mentioned this afternoon, and I can't quite remember, but had the, what size of holding um, would be needed to be able to put this up under agricultural exemptions. I see in your report you say this is a 4.94 hectare holding. So um, it's five hectares is the threshold uh, for, for agricultural development. So and that was the, the how they initially tried to put the application in and which is what the, the agent Mr. Venson has referred to in terms of the, 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 the applicant had disposed of some land which took them below the threshold. Um, Ultimately, this is a planning application now, so those tests don't apply, so we just have to consider it on its own merits regardless, and, and that those tests are that we're satisfied that there's a need, and that the other planning considerations like visual amenity, other amenity, flood risk, drainage, et cetera, are satisfied. Yeah, well, as, yeah, I mean, just, just to conclude, it, it is the sort of building I would expect to see in an agricultural landscape. There could be extra opportunities taken with screening. I mean, looking at some of those photographs, you have the opportunity to put some emergent trees along in the in the hedgerows that are are near to the building that might enhance the screening. But with the fact that the drainage scheme is accepted, um, I I don't have too much problem with this. And um, dependent on any other members' comments, I would propose um, acceptance. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from members? And I'm looking for a seconder if there's no other further comments or questions. Councillor Pearce. I'm happy to second the officer's recommendation. Thank you. All those in favour of uh, granting permission, please show. That's unanimously carried, so that is permission granted. Thank you very much. Members, that brings us to the end of the applications we have before us this afternoon. So can I thank you all for your uh, participation both this morning and this afternoon. We'll close the meeting and we'll be back in four weeks time. Thank you very much. Thank you.